Thank you to everyone listening and watching. I'm Syra Levinson, Deputy Director and Gail Engelberg Director of Education and Public Engagement here at the Guggenheim. Welcome. In the 1930s, Hilla Ribe, the founding director of the Guggenheim Museum, brought to life a vision for a new kind of art experience in a new kind of space. Ribe's project was at once artistic and social. She championed socially engaged art practices, artists that cross borders and boundaries, and risk-taking avant-garde aesthetics. We remain committed to and focused on this vision today. In the past year, we committed ourselves to achieving greater equity in how we use our space, both physical and digital, and to amplifying the voices of those who have not been seen, heard, or perhaps even felt welcome in it before. Today's program presented with our partner, The World Around, is part of a year-long residency that focuses on design's profound role in social, environmental, and spatial justice. The World Around looks beyond buildings to investigate the forces that shape our lives, homes, cities, and landscapes. From discussing urgent issues of the climate crisis with anthropologists and artists, to examining global vernacular construction, to highlighting the racial inequalities manifest in the built environment, this residency explores the many different spheres, real, imaginary, and symbolic, of contemporary architectural practices today and champions its practitioners to a broad public. To notice is a privilege and a responsibility. To not notice is a sign of privilege. I recognize that we stand on Manahata, traditional territory of the Lenape Nation. I also recognize that our gathering today in the digital space is made possible because of the extraction of materials from the land. It's time to think of land beyond resource and commodity, to think from the land. I wish to acknowledge the work of many people who have made it possible for Beatrice and I to be present with you today. My colleagues who run our theater, our film crew, the visitor services, operations, and security teams who make it possible for all of us to be safely here together today. Our curatorial colleagues, fundraising team, and communications teams have been working behind the scenes to support this program as well. I also wish to share my deep gratitude to Jennifer Yee, Alan Seiss, and Lely Amigi, who make up our incredible public programs team and who have helped to organize today's event. I'd like to thank our trustees and the leadership team of the museum who support the mission of this institution. And I extend my gratitude to the family of Elaine Turner Cooper for their generous support of programming at the Guggenheim and for making this event possible. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to extend my thanks to Beatrice Galilee, executive director and co-founder of The World Around, who will introduce today's presenters and program. Beatrice. Thank you so much, Syra. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be back at the Guggenheim, um, and thanks so much to you and your team um, for being such fantastic partners for this whole year. Um, many of you will remember the world around, uh, maybe know the world around for our annual summit, um, which is a back-to-back -back, um, extravaganza of the best architecture of the previous year. Um, and that will be coming up again um, in January. Um, but today, in this new format um, that we've developed with the Guggenheim, um, we're taking the opportunity to slow down a little and draw attention to some dimensions of practice that are critical uh, to understanding the discipline of architecture today. Not only with this event, um, but also through our newsletter, we will be distributing essays and short films that will also dive deeper and look further in focus at land. In some ways, the world around is trying to make a first draft of architectural history. We ask, what are the values of designers today? What are the things, the ideas, the movements, the people that we will lead from and follow into the future? 
Who are the lighthouses that will prevent us from crashing into the rocks? We believe that land is one of the most pressing discussions of the moment, and that there can be no discussion about reducing carbon footprint and preventing carbon-based catastrophe without taking into account the architecture's relationship with land. We're not just talking about urban land or urban life. In fact, 97% of America's land, North America's land, is rural, even though one in five residents live there. Landscapes, as we will find out through the speakers today, are not neutral. They have agency, they are lifelines, they contain broken promises, and they have potential. Landscapes have the opportunity to recalibrate the climate crisis, but only if the people who live there, whose relationship to the land is profound, can be integrated into the conversation. A lot of the discussions that we'll be hearing today will be around people, communities, labor, and the role of design is something that is um, sometimes profound and fundamental, and sometimes it's more opaque. And I encourage everyone who's watching to consider the role of design and architecture in these conversations. While these presentations stand alone as singular ideas, they also work together harmoniously as a, as a kind of community of thought, um, presenting what we try to create as a kind of multi-dimensional introduction to the issues of land today. The World Around is a nonprofit public charity based in New York City, and we're dedicated to the idea of champions, championing progressive issues and ideas in architecture. We are made possible from the support of our board of directors, from individual donations, and our corporate sponsors. And I'd really like to extend a profound thanks to all of those people. In particular, our new corporate sponsor, Amura, thank you and welcome. And also to Facebook Open Arts, and in particular to Tina Vaz, the director there who has been part of our journey since day one and um, who saw the vision from the very beginning. So thank you, Open Arts. Um, we wouldn't really be here without you. I'd also like to mention that we have a fantastic board of advisors at The World Around, um, and Satomi Blair, who is our executive producer, has um, been an absolute hero, and we're so grateful to her. I'd also like to thank Elsa Hoover, who has written a fantastic essay that we'll be distributing um, later this month. Please subscribe to our newsletter to make sure you don't miss that. So on to session one. Um, what we're going to be seeing today is um, a series of three sessions, uh, community, technology, and ecology. In each of the sessions, there will be two short films followed by a discussion. And I really would love you all to be involved in that discussion. The first two films today will be from Joseph Kunkel, who will be speaking to the work of the Sustainable Native Communities Design Lab, and Rene Kemp-Rotan, whose vision has led to the Africa Town um, International Design Competition, which is an absolutely fascinating story that I'm sure you'll all want to dig into. These two seemingly different um, ideas are exploring the role of community in design and architecture, an architecture and a community attitude that talks about the ground up, listening to people, designing for people, not for people, but with people. Um, and I'm so glad to say that we have Emmanuel Admasu, who is an academic and a scholar, who will be moderating the discussion uh, between Rene and Joseph. Um, so we look forward to um, the presentations, we look forward to the discussion, and um, I'll see you um, for session two um, in about an hour. Thank you so much. So I'm Joseph Kunkel, and we're in the office of Mass Design Group, where we lead the Sustainable Native Communities Design Lab. We're located in the lands of the Oge Poge, uh, which is a Tewa name for white shell water place also known as uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. So we're working with tribal communities around the country. Uh, we're focused on lifting up indigenous voices, bringing design thinking, design processes to communities that haven't historically had access to design. Whenever we engage with a new partner, a, a new tribal community, a community that we've never worked with before, it really does start with trying to set the tone that we are outsiders. I might be native, I'm, Northern Cheyenne, but I'm typically not indigenous to the communities that we're historically working in. And so understanding those cultural nuances, I think, is really 
important as designers. Hopefully, the processes and the research that we're moving to will create an architecture that really reflects a community's particular connection to place. And that connection to place is also the connection to land, is connection to culture, is connection to how we think about community. The bigger goal here is to not copy-paste solutions throughout Indian country. That has been done before. So Aquasazni, located along the St. Regis River in upstate New York, is a project that is focused on bringing affordable housing home ownership to the Aquasazni community. It's designed to be an eco-village, and so lifting up the kind of sustainability uh, means and methods and, and thinking that the tribe has historically thought about. And so reckoning back to the longhouse and how individuals and families and, and community members would live collectively in a longhouse. Now, Aquasazni is not going to go back and live in a longhouse communally, but the forms can kind of be informed by the longhouse. And this is where I think Western thought and indigenous knowledge come together, right? How can we use Western ways of thinking about housing, meld that together with uh, an Aquasazni way of thinking about housing, and develop condos, apartments in this kind of longhouse form, and then kind of put these longhouse forms together to create shared spaces and ways of, uh, of generating community. This notion around affordable housing or building affordability in housing is incredibly important. How are we owning the homes and, and, and being in control of, of the homes and, and the architecture and the built environment that we build rather than it being given to us by the federal government? This is another kind of historic issue that we see all over Indian country, right? The Army Corps of Engineers has come in and dammed rivers and have flooded villages. Aquasazni has undammed one of their rivers uh, to allow for cultural activities to happen within the community. When we talk about sovereignty and we talk about self-determination, like that's a way of flexing that sovereignty. That's a way of flexing that self-determination. In this instance, trying to bring indigenous knowledge into this space has been something that has helped guide the project. The architecture should be responding to its place. It should be responding to the land. Should the St. Regis flood, how do we let it flood? And how do we design homes, housing, buildings that can respond to that? And I think the idea and concept here is to not engineer our way out of this. Willamette Falls is a complex project. We frame it as the Willamette Falls Tribal Engagement Project. What we've been tasked with was to ensure and engage the tribes that have historically claimed a connection to the falls. And so many of the communities that we've been working with, their histories, their creation stories come from this place. They've been part of the falls since time immemorial. Yet historically, or, or when we think about the narrative that has surrounded Willamette Falls in this kind of near past, is really much more about the kind of Western conquest. Our goal was to kind of engage with each individual tribal community along with the urban indigenous communities to ensure that their voices are part of the redevelopment um, of the river. The project is not about the development of the site, it's more about how is the river walk lifting up the voices of the surrounding tribal communities. And the hope for our work is to kind of solidify in a series of design recommendations that would then inform the design of the river walk. And these design recommendations would come from the tribe. It's not up to us to, to do that. Every tribe has their own history as it relates to the falls. And so how do we ensure that their voices are being heard? Whatever has been built historically has not been for us, not been by us. If we are truly acknowledging the land, then we should be creating spaces, places, conversations for empowering individuals and empowering communities rather than just kind of tokenizing them. How are we integrating that kind of indigenous knowledge in the academy? How are we educating the next generation of natives to kind of work in this space? Uh, how are we training non-natives to be working in, in an indigenous space? People are at the table wanting to have these conversations. That, I think, is productive. Uh, and we need to 
move that conversation from this notion of mistrust to a place of trust and relationship building. And then when we think about healing, when we think about the practice, it's going to take both sides, natives and non-natives, to be working in the space to lift up the issues, the social justice issues, the community issues that we see all over Indian country, if we're going to have some sense of impact. My name is Renee Kimfro-Tan. I'm an urban designer and also master planner. You know, for me, coming to this place was, you know, fairly significant. I'm from D.C. And each time I went deeper and deeper into the South, I got confronted by this culture and also by this history, Africatown. I didn't even know it existed. Africatown is extremely significant because it is the only African settlement built in America by Africans. All of the other black settlements, all of the other black chartered towns, all of the other black exodusters were built by Africans born in America. I have been in the great state of Alabama now for 10 plus years and here I have a vernacular that is within driving distance and I never heard about it. Right now we're in what I would call the heart of Africa town in the northern section of Mobile, Alabama. I'm a retired Marine Major Joe Womack, Africa town native. There are descendants in Africa town today that are directly bloodline related to those same 110 Africans that got off of that boat, Clotilda, in 1860. We have the story itself that nobody knew about. We have the descendants, and then we got their descendants. Then we got the community that's still here. And then we got the struggle and the fight that's going on right now just for survival. These people know that history, and you have these blood memories that are coming through these elders. And until that boat was found, the Clotilda, in 2019, there were so many denials among the dominant culture that the boat even existed in the first place. Now that the boat has been found, the people in Africa town feel fully vindicated. We told you so. Now we have another kind of question. Who's going to own the story? It does make a difference now if a slave ship that is found is told through the story of the blood memory of people that suffered on that boat versus the kinds of stories that come from curators that see the boat as just a fine American artifact. Now this is an interesting twist here about the boat. Originally when the boat was found, a lot of folk in the dominant culture said, oh my God, this is gonna be the greatest tourist attraction of all time. We can actually build a replica of the slave ship and we can have folks on there buying tickets for dinners and martinis as we take them on the replica of the slave ship to where the actual slave ship was found. This slave ship was a living, floating prison for the captives who were there. So the community saying, how dare they turn this into some kind of tourist attraction. So now we go through this whole thing about who is going to curate that story. I want the world to know what we have here. This is such a historic community. I would hate for somebody to just ride through here about 50 years from today and see a marker that said Africa Town used to be here. Okay, you've seen it, you know the story, now do something about it. You're a designer, do something. Well, what can I possibly do? First of all, I'm not from this place. So the notion that you would pluck me out of one place and put me in another place and say, do something, what can I do? 
we're going to need something within the community to bring people in, something people can come to tour. We want people to be able to come to Mobile or come to Africatown. There are so many spots within Africatown that is wide open to the imagination. We began to ask questions about, well, who owns public history? Who gets to tell their story? And how many voices does this story get to be told? So I came with this idea. I said, you know something that might work? The idea of a competition. Let's put a competition together that's only dealing with design ideas. Because a competition is kind of an overlay over whatever else is going on. We're going to do a design idea competition to design a museum. And it's a great idea because in order to program a museum, you've got to know about the history, that'll come back to you. You've got to artifact the history, that will come back to you, and then you have this interpretive overlay. And the community said, we need more than a museum. When the tourism come here, we don't have no motel. They got to stay downtown. We don't have no restaurants. They're going to have to eat downtown. That's why we're trying to get involved in tourism so we can do that ourselves. We know the community more than anybody. When you look at the land right now, you have sections owned by residents. But then around those sections, the land is owned by businesses that have managed to move in, into the area. With industry, it, it just pollutes the heck out of everything. And pollution is just simply another word for poison. It gets to you slowly, and that's what happened over the years. We accidentally stumbled in on a community-led movement. Those people in Africatown have been fighting for generations about land use and zoning and funding. They need to do something positive for the community on their land. Do something positive for the community instead of fighting against the community. Those things hinder the ability of the residents and especially communities of color from obtaining wealth and passing that wealth on to your generation, next generation. If I had a magic wand, I would just wave it and, 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 and have them give the land to the community and then get out of the way. All the land within the boundaries of the community. As they say in the South, land is more valuable than money. So this notion of the competition also serving a very profound role in engaging the descendant community in all kinds of activity that began to inform the competition is what allowed the competition to grow from this, I've got a great idea museum, into literally 16 venues that the community said they wanted we decided to just play in the realm of design ideas. Certainly I, as a visitor to this unknown place, we don't own anything, we're design ideas. And what that means is that when all the ideas come in, we can give you and the community a catalog of a whole bunch of possibilities, and you guys could actually build something. I organized the competition into four main sites, and each of the sites have sub venues attached to them. All of these 16 places can be connected by both land and water, which now becomes a totally immersive tourist experience. The Africatown Cultural Mile, all of these architectonics that are combined because of, you know, thematic directives that are implied in how the competition was programmed. We're hoping that this cultural heritage uh, tourism that has developed over the last four or five years is, is, is not going to diminish, but it's just going to keep climbing. The competition started Juneteenth, 2021. It will run until Juneteenth, 2022. So we are like totally thrilled at what could happen. We want you to uh, communicate the Africatown story on the others. It's a hell of a story. Pass it on. It really does have and should have long-term implications that could help the community. This community has been here for 162 years, and we'd like for it to be here for 162 more years. Um, good afternoon, everyone.
First of all, uh, I just want to start off by saying thank you to Renee and Joseph. Um, it is an honor to be here to discuss and celebrate the deeply inspiring work uh, that both of you are doing. Um, these are obviously urgent issues that, that require extensive uh, collective thinking and collective imagination. So I'm really happy to be here moderating this discussion. Um, maybe we can start off by maybe talking about your project, Joseph. Um, I was really inspired by your thoughts around sovereignty and self-determination, especially uh, within indigenous contexts where various state agencies are building infrastructure that causes environmental harm and really basically makes these uh, spaces uninhabitable. So how are you thinking beyond, let's say the architectural or urban design scale to apply political pressure um, against these state agencies and multinational corporations that are displacing or dispossessing indigenous communities. Uh, thank you, no, Emmanuel. Um, thank you all for this conversation today. I think we'll kind of start, and, and a lot of our work starts with kind of acknowledgement and, and just kind of acknowledging the spaces that Kind of we inhabit and being trained as an architect, a planner, a designer. I think uh, ways in which we approach these conversations are acknowledging the spaces that we're coming from, right? And uh, I think uh, when I when I think about this work, it's really acknowledging my bias biases as a uh, as someone who's trained kind of in in this profession. So the idea that this this work is kind of based in uh, a kind of a Western Eurocentro thought, and that's how I was trained. Uh, yet, kind of my background as a as a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation is important to lift up, uh, and 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 trying to kind of understand those two spaces. Uh, um, and so, I think the ways in which we practice uh, this idea of practicing and. and coming to the space uh, as both natives and non-natives. We kind of on our staff, we have non-natives practicing in this space uh, that I, I think is important and, and trying to kind of understand how we can leverage both sides um, of, of, of the conversation. Um, we know that this kind of, uh, we have, we know that history is not going to, uh, we, we can't correct what has been done historically but we can use that as a point of departure to kind of understand where we're going. And by acknowledging the past, acknowledging the injustices that have been done uh, and, and using that as a point of departure to kind of understand how we practice, how we think about the built environment, I think can inform uh, ways in which we can influence policy, right? So if we're thinking specifically about housing, how do we ensure that a, a pre-development, pre-design process that we're leveraging uh, good design uh, in affordable housing, in community facilities and health facilities, uh, that inevitably that will influence how we think about policy. Like if we can prove that this works, that, that design uh, is, is, is part of the kind of solution, is part of the healing process, then I think we're moving, we're moving forward. And, and I think hopefully the, those that are kind of in uh, political power kind of understand the power of design as, as I think we, we see it. Thank you. Um, I think similarly for you, Renee, uh, there seems to be a looming threat caused by the various industries that basically surround Africa town. Um, and, and to me, that seems to also be an issue of sovereignty. Uh, there is, you know, um, the, the potential that these industries will be the ones benefiting from the tourist economy, for example. So how can we think collectively about issues of sovereignty that make sure that the, the wealth generated from, from this particular tourist economy is actually injected in uh, the descendants, uh, uh, like in, in the African town and descendant community? That's a very good question. Uh, first of all, it has to happen by design. It cannot be uh, at all uh, incidental. It cannot be at all accidental. But I think that first of all, when we're talking about tourism as a lever for the interpretation of descendant history, we first need to agree on what that history is and who that history is going to be told by, for whom, using whose words 
and through whose experience. Um, I was basically brought into the Africa Town conversation by Vicki Howell, an award-winning journalist uh, out of Birmingham. We worked on the Birmingham Civil Rights Heritage Trail together. I put the system together and then hired her to write the words. So we know from our experience, even in terms of talking about the pain of the Birmingham Civil Rights Movement, that words are very important, how we use them to explain, how we use them to basically uh, engage. And so we decided to do this competition because it was really very much felt that even after the ship was found, we were not very secure in how the Clotilda as the last slave ship would be tied back to the Africa town story. Uh, the dominant culture was extremely excited about having found the ship. It was generally agreed that the finding of the last slave ship would be tied to tourism in downtown Africa, in downtown Mobile. Um, the community, of course, had a major issue uh, with that notion. And so as part of the negotiation, it was decided that the Mobile County Commission would use money to have a heritage house built in Africatown proper, and then various artifacts from the boat's finding could literally reach into the community. And that was a good thing. However, uh, that one building does not tell the story, and that one building itself is surrounded by industrial zoning. So we're going to have to do this with tweezers. We have um, a very active community in uh, Africa Town, uh, such as Joe Womack, Ramsey Sprague, Anderson Flynn, the descendant community. Many of the descendants still live there. And while we're having this conversation about tourism, this community almost on a monthly basis is fighting zoning legislation that would in fact, if not carefully monitored, would increase the proliferation of industry around Africa Town. Even though it's a historic district, what I usually say is the Africa Town historic district is slowly shrinking because of these kinds of threats to environment. On the good side of the tip, uh, we also have uh, activists who have secured uh, Brownsville grants to really begin to pick through you know, the 22 locations within Africa Town that could be tied to tourism, but that are de definitively tied to um, really bad poisons and, 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 and pollutions. Um, I, I think the one thing that has not happened, which is why the Africa Town International Design Idea Competition was invented, is that we have not yet found as a body of stakeholders and community, ways of tying all of these sites and all of these stories into one comprehensive and unique user experience. Because the story of Africa Town is much larger than the historic district. The story of Africa Town literally goes from the historic district all the way up the waterfronts into Pritchard, Alabama which is a 10 mile stretch, all right? So this notion of who tells the story and where it gets told, Africa Town is much bigger than just the historic um, you know, district. And the only way that I think that industries are gonna be put in check is if collectively we as a human community can agree that poisons in one community ends up being poisons in another. We can't even really want to bring tourists into a poisonous environment to have a discussion about the greatness of the story. So the big reveal really has everything to do with the competition as a mechanism to raise public awareness about the power of design, the importance of the story, the engagement of the community in the telling of their own stories, not as a matter of happenstance, but as a necessity that's also tied to morality. These Africans were kidnapped uh, more than 160 years ago, dragged across the ocean, placed on plantations. Five years later, they were emancipated. 
And most people say, oh my goodness, they were emancipated, they created this town. Well, it wasn't exactly that easy. The 13th Amendment freed the slaves and the 14th Amendment gave emancipated people access to citizenship and therefore the ability to buy land. The 14th Amendment, however, did not apply to the Africans that got off the boat because the fine print of the 14th Amendment basically said that citizenship and the purchase of land, even for emancipated slaves, only applied to those slaves who had been born in America. So the Clotilda Africans had to have the wherewithal to first of all become naturalized citizens in order to even buy the land that we now talk about as Africatown, which is the only African settlement built in America by Africans. So the wherewithal of these kidnapped people to figure out in a different culture, in a different language, different laws, how to even access their ability to buy land is also a very important part, you know, of the story. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really what I love about the idea of the design competition, because at the end of the day, it basically amplifies or even multiplies uh, the story of Africatown's descendants. And that is always kind of working against the dominant narrative, which is basically trying to sanitize or erase uh, that story. So, I mean, maybe linking uh, these uh, two projects together, Joseph and your project, um, there also seems to be a deep interest in storytelling, especially uh, with the falls. Um, and in that case, you're basically dealing with the dominance of the colonial narrative. Right, um, and and how you can basically counteract that narrative by engaging with these specific tribes and trying to make sure that their histories are registered in the River Walk. So, can you speak a little bit more about your approach to storytelling and how that begins to affect the the actual material conditions that would be proposed by uh, the design guidelines? Yeah, I, so the work at the around the Willamette Falls, I think, is a it's it's a, an important one, and it's a story that we see across uh, what is now the United States. Um, and and the dominant narrative at the falls currently is the narrative of uh, the Oregon Trail, right, Western settlement, and and that is the history that we hear, uh, the kind of narrative that we're hoping to kind of uh, reframe and, 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 and tell differently here is the connection to the falls by uh, these five indigenous tribes, right? So their histories are connected to this place since time immemorial. This is where creation stories happen. This is, this is uh, inevitably where uh, the kind of understanding of power started. Uh, and so how can we ensure that when it comes to the, the, the design of this river walk, when it, when it comes to the, the design of, uh, or the kind of forward thinking of how uh, one connects to place, uh, ensuring that these, these communities have their voices at the table. Um, it's not up to us to decide, um, to decide those narratives. And so part of the engagement process really is meant to uh, think about ways in which uh, they are telling the story and not not us, not not the city, not the owners of the land. It's really about ensuring that they have a seat at the table to ensure that their voices are being uh, kind of lifted up and 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 ensuring that there there is this connection to place, that there's this connection to the to the land. Um, and and moving aside from uh, these are your reservation lands, go over there. Well, no. This is, this is where tribes traded. This is where marriages happened. This is where uh, kind of uh, fish uh, traps kind of, kind of gathered. And so uh, how can we ensure that their uh, voices are being lifted up and, and told uh, in a way that is reflected in their histories, not, not a history that uh, as an outsider we create. So I think it's really important to understand those connections and, and, and telling their histories. And I, and I, I say histories because uh, many different tribes have, have histories, right? It's not the history that is in the, in the history books. It is 
uh, the creation stories that kind of talk about why we're here. Uh, and, and it's okay for uh, different tribes to have different histories. There are 574 federally recognized tribes and their creation stories are all different. And to lift up that narrative, I think is important uh, that we don't all have the same histories. And, and I think that's, that's okay, but that's not the kind of Western narrative that we hear. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really beautiful way to put it. I mean, um, but I do want to kind of uh, ask a follow-up, which is, you know, I would assume it's always a process of co-authorship because at the end of the day, you guys would have to gather, collect these stories, but then translate them into actual uh, design strategies, right? Uh, so, I mean, that makes me think a little bit about the risk of representation. And, and I think this is also relevant to your project, Renee, and how do we make sure that we maintain, uh, you know, the, these histories, uh, but also make sure that we don't enter into the realm of tokenization, basically. I'm, I'm loving the question. Um, you know, we have a little trick up our sleeve in Africatown. Uh, we are actually now using what we're calling the rubric. There is a very profound document um, that was commissioned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation to produce a document that is called Engaging Descendant Communities on the History of American Slavery for Monuments, Memorials, and Interpretive Sites. And it's co-authored by uh, Dr. Michael Blakey, who is a leading forensic archeologist who literally was the inspector of the bones at the uh, African burial ground in New York City. He's a good friend also from DC. And we have brought him down to Africatown as part of civic engagement to talk about the stories that the bones in fact can tell about the conditions of a people. We have a historic, Africatown Cemetery that was created in 1868 by the same Africans that got off of the boat. Their descendants are still living. They remember those stories. We call it in the competition, the history of blood memory. But we're using this rubric and I tell everybody go online and look up, you know, engaging descendant communities. Uh, it's a very important treatise because this is the only time in American history where there has been a grading system established so that those of us who are interested in the work and those of us who may not be interested in the work can be graded against this very profound set of performance standards that measure proficiency in terms of understanding and including culture all the way down to you know, the subterranean anti-moral reasons that people talk about community engagement, but don't want to really tell the truth about what actually happened with a group of people. So the way that we deal with uh, the competition is we say that the programming of the four sites and the 16 venues has got to come through this term that we call multivocality. You cannot talk about a disenfranchised people if the only people who are doing the talking are the disenfranchised people. You also have to have conversations with those people who saw fit to demoralize, to chain, to kidnap these human beings and put them in a state of ill regard. So with the competition, we have uh, my favorite page of the competition really on the website, www.africatowndesign.com is the resource page. Because even though I was visiting this community and that's what Joseph is saying, we as designers are outsiders who are visiting. But those of us who are trained designers who are also politically aware, spiritually aware, we have to do a profound amount of digging down deep. So in the competition, we have a resource page with more than 40 books that I personally bought so that I in fact could understand where and when I had actually landed. So the rubric is how we create this notion of multivocality. And the rubric says you cannot just have one meeting and ask everyone who likes cornbread, I do, I do. The rubric really, really insists that the natives of this history 
are profoundly included in all the research that goes on, that the research in fact that is found is approved and that is a part of their collective interpretation because everybody doesn't see the story the same way. You know, and the people who have lived it and who have been cautioned by their ancestors and elders to remember it should have a place front and center at the table. The rubric also says that to do the oral histories and everybody goes home is also not enough. These same yeah. people must be used as docents continuously as the story unfolds in all of the places that interpretation happens. So that's yeah. just one of the methodologies that we- I love, I love that idea of this rubric for uh, multivocality. Um, maybe uh, Joseph, you can speak a little bit more about you know, your approaches to this particular issue as well. I mean, you, you presented the provocation in your own video where you said, you know, there's obviously a thin line between empowerment uh, and tokenizing uh, these communities. So can you speak a little bit more about how you guys measure success, but also how you begin to establish certain rubrics uh, for, for the projects you're developing? Yeah, sure. I think that's an important question. And I'm kind of lifting up some of Renee's points around, around this work. I think it's, it's having those that have historically kind of caused the harm part of the conversation. I think that's important to lift up. And, and a lot of the times when I talk about uh, acknowledging or the kind of notion around a land acknowledgement, sometimes it's more important for those that aren't indigenous to a place to kind of acknowledge the places in which we're inhabiting, right? And so I think some of the rigor that we have been bringing to this project in particular is doing kind of our kind of historical kind of background, trying to meet with each of the individual communities and, and different people in each of these individual communities, different organizations to try and understand uh, or attempt to understand what is the history of this place and, and meeting individually and then trying to kind of understand and repeat back or, or, or try and kind of say, this is what we heard, did we hear it right? Or in what ways can we correct what we have done? I think uh, as designers, we have to really kind of understand the power of design and the power for a narrative that influence how we can kind of see a future. Uh, and, and while we're kind of reflecting on the past, I think the, the, the impetus is to really project out into the future. Uh, a lot of the work that we're doing and is generational change, right? This is work that won't, we won't see the change uh, potentially in our lifetimes, but, but moving it forward and, and planning for our, our, our children's grandchildren and their children to ensure that their voices are part of this history. I think we're in a moment in time where uh, we're coming to kind of reconcile the histories of what is now the United States. And I think in particular, the kind of the Willamette Falls Trust kind of is this, our, our partner in this, in, in the work at uh, Willamette Falls is really trying to kind of change the narrative of the falls and, and, and ensure that those that have historically called this place home and 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 this is inevitably where creation stories happen that that they are they are in in some ways uh, a way in which uh they can leverage that narrative um and so how can we ensure uh that a design process is part of that yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense but it also makes me think a little bit more about uh projection you know and and how both, both of your uh, projects are really thinking about uh, history in a very critical way, but how, how does that history basically project an alternative future? Um, and, you know, because we are obviously discussing land and this uh, issue, I'm wondering if you guys are also thinking creatively about collective forms of ownership that basically resist real estate speculation or other forms of uh, dispossession and displacement? Yeah. Um, should I attempt to answer that question? Um, let me chime in for just one second. You know, interestingly enough, when the community said, we don't want a competition about a single building, because originally it was just gonna be a, about, you know, a history, a make-believe history museum, we need more than that. 
So we got to four sites and 16 venues because we threw in everything the community said they wanted. But I have to tell you what's really cool about the competition. It just so happens that everything that they said they wanted, the four sites and the 16 venues, each one of those 16 venues is located on a piece of publicly controlled land. What an advantage. That means that once the competition is ended and these options come in from all over the world, we will be presenting the co community with a catalog of hundreds of ideas that they now can basically take to each one of the sites and begin negotiating around some things that may not have been ever thought about or thought of, all right? The other great thing that's happened is that uh, in first coming to Africatown, there were four or five different community development corporations. Uh, everybody was kind of looking at a different end of the elephant, as they say. And sometimes we know that an elephant designed by a committee becomes a strange looking animal. So the community got together and they really created um, another option. They now have created the Africatown, um, uh, I'm having a brain fart here, uh, the Africatown um, Historic Preservation Foundation, that's it. And this entity will serve as an umbrella over all of the community groups, which means that now we're talking about a co-joined and very progressive uh, institution uh, created by a community that will then begin to look at not the creation of another master plan, but the creation of an economic development plan that now has dollars and cost estimates attached to all of the things that we find in the master plan uh, itself. It's that economic development plan that will really end up being the driver to where the community will be able to generate revenue back to itself based on the tourism that everyone is talking about. That economic development plan will serve as instruction as to how that gets done. That economic development plan around tourism can also be used as a contract for negotiation with the city and also developers. One last thing, we also brought in a young man from Seattle, Washington. There's an Africatown in Seattle, Washington, Y. King Garrett. We brought him to Africatown because he's established a community land trust uh, in Seattle. And so we are really always bringing new information to the community. We brought the um, past president of the American Institute of Architects to Africatown to talk about what engaged and politically conscious architects, in fact, can lend to a community that is you know, going towards self-determination and self-sufficiency. So organizationally, things have to be you know, in alignment in order to make uh, this notion of what to do with land um, um, work for yeah. everyone. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Joseph, you want to jump in and maybe? Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, this this notion of, and I think what uh, what is so powerful about the work that you're doing, Renee, is starting to kind of redefine wealth or redefine ways in which those where those dollars are going. And I think in the work that we're doing, in in and is is trying to kind of come up with a new way to redefine wealth creation. And so if we kind of go back to some of the housing work and trying to kind of understand, well, who is empowered? And, and if we look at land, uh, some of the first conversations that we have with a community is like, do you have land control? Do you have, do you have, do you have site control? And that is very much based in this kind of Western context, right? Even if we're working on tribal trust land. And so inevitably that land has kind of monetary value, right? But on tribal trust land, uh, it, it, it's being held in trust by the federal government. And so how can we ensure that we're thinking about redefining or, or kind of valuing that in a way? And this is kind of where kind of Western ideology and indigenous knowledge kind of come together is like, we know, uh, we, we know we can't like put, put this kind of capitalist to like read uh, or, or start new. We can't like erase capitalism uh, just yet. 
but I think we have the opportunity to kind of redefine what that means in an indigenous context. And so how can we ensure that we're kind of lifting up cultural values, that we're lifting up the kind of indigenous knowledge as it relates to kind of uh, access to land, uh, access to place, uh, the history of these places. And so if we can value that in, in a way that uh, kind of lifts up the indigenous knowledge, I think we're moving in the right direction, inevitably kind of redefining what wealth could mean from a cultural perspective, uh, from a, a cultural values perspective. And I think that's uh, where inevitably we're, we're trying to get to so that we can uh, understand wealth in a different way. Yeah, I mean, what I find most exciting also about this conversation is that obviously there are so many overlaps between your projects and, and it just shows the endless potential of building some sort of indigenous and black solidarity when it comes to addressing these issues directly. Uh, so I'm just wondering, you know, if you guys are thinking in those terms, if there are ways in which you can potentially begin to collaborate or uh, exchange notes, et cetera. Well, I tell you, you know, really, I guess there has been a genre uh, created of, um, shall I say, citizen architects who are uh, basically very sensitized to this notion of black and brown space. Uh, we're beginning to know each other. We're beginning to follow each other's work. We're beginning to include one another on opportunities to rebuild communities. So, you know, these kinds of public engagements that are coming through the Guggenheim are extremely important so that we can talk about our work as well as aspects of intercollaboration. I know that for Africatown, for example, I'm gonna hold this up. Um, this is some research that was done uh, with the community and it really has to do with our having identified uh, through the works of Zora Neale Hurston's 1927 photographs and 1927 interviews with the founders of Africatown, what their houses look like. We use those words and pictures to generate construction drawings to rebuild Kajo Lewis's house. And so as designers, we're saying not only will we rebuild the house, but we're strongly suggesting that that house once it's rebuilt becomes a neighborhood housing center so we can really talk about how in the world were Africans able to build a settlement in the 19th century. And here we are in the 21st century, surely we need to know how they did that. So some of those lessons about collaboration, tribal and community wise can be repeated for good cause and get some stuff really uh, done that will bring wealth back to this community, starting with home ownership, something as simple as home, home ownership, and then generating revenue from the tourism yeah. back to the community as well. A wide range of economic uh, development imperatives, I think we can share some of those stories and lessons. Absolutely. Joseph? I mean, I would say, I mean, we're now is we're pro this moment in history, we're primed for like collaboration. I think this idea of, or the kind of concepts around how we can work together, ways in which we can work together, I think uh, we can learn a lot from what has happened in history. And so the work in Indian country, the work happening in African American urban and rural communities, uh, there's a lot there uh, that I think from a architectural standpoint, from an urban design standpoint, from a, a planning standpoint, we can learn from uh, that we don't always have to kind of fall back on our traditional kind of uh, Western Beaux-Arts education, right? And so how can we kind of lift up uh, ways in which we think about culture and how does culture kind of play a pivotal role in how we think about um, building community uh, and I, I building community in the kind of most kind of simple sense. It's like we're, we're inevitably we're going to move forward. And so how can we use that as a as a precedent for for future generations? And I think uh, when we talk about coming together in a, and I kind of reckon back to so the, the kind of teepee encampments, right? So that's a very much an urban form, the, the ability to kind of be in community with one another. Yet we look at it as this kind of uh, this kind of historical way of thinking, and so how can we use that as we think about planning new uh, uh, housing developments in in terms of 
eyesight, like uh, the, the kind of basis of how we thought about a TP encampment was it, you would set the diameter in, in a way that you would see uh, your, your neighbor. And so what does that mean when you walk out your front door and, and you can see your neighbor and make those that kind of eye to eye connection. And so there's values there that we can incorporate in contemporary design and, and, and we're not going to go back to living in teepees, but there are nuances there that we can lift up and, and, and use in, in a contemporary way, which I find pretty empowering. Right. And so, uh, and that's where I think Western, again, Western ideology, Eurocentro ideology, ideology kind of comes together with kind of indigenous knowledge and indigenous practices. So what are those nuances that we can kind of extract and apply in a contemporary way, which I find uh, very empowering. Can I just add uh, something to that yeah, for yeah. a second? Um, this is a beautiful conversation because in listening to Joseph, I'm reminded that one of the collaborations that has happened in Africa town is the collaboration across disciplines. We are not merely just working with, you know, architects and quote unquote, the community, but some fascinating things begin to happen when you make historians a part of your team and archeologists a part of your team and public health officials a part of your team. For example, we know that in putting together the competition, uh, we did a whole bunch of research on what is called post-traumatic slavery syndrome. And it really has to do with not just the oral histories, you know, that the elders tell, but we never have stopped to take a look at the impact of these enslavements whether they be tribal or whether they be, you know, African emancipated people, what the public health toll on this, these people were psychologically. And so until you bring in psychologists as part of the team and archaeologists such as Michael Blakey, who actually read the bones, this man is literally a bone reader. And through his work uh, at the New York City uh, burial ground, he said to us, he said, do you have any idea what it is when I see and I uncover these interred bones of ex-slaves? The bone fractures, the skull fractures begin to tell stories of abuse that most people would not know because the evidence of the bones have been buried. So I think this notion of collaboration between tribe and African American community is important. And I also think what is immensely important is breaking down these silos between disciplines that are beginning to put together the social history of these people who have been affected so that we can rebuild healthy communities, you know, at the end of the day, which is more than just a building. We like to say in Africa town that there's a poem in this place. We've arrived in a very sacred place about a very sacred story. And so all of that spirit feeling has also gets blown into the interpretation of the built environment so that we become whole people and whole communities. Yeah, um, I love that. Basically kind of continuing to expand, you know, the people that we speak to as urban designers and, and architects. And I think maybe this connects a little bit to uh, the subtle critique that you presented, Joseph, in your video, where um, I think at some point you said, we, can't, we cannot en engineer our way out of this. Uh, and it almost seemed like some sort of, uh, you know, oblique critique at certain tendencies within sustainability discourse that assume that technology will solve these problems, right? But listening to you guys speak, uh, there is a much richer kind of social tapestry that could augment uh, some of the technological advancements as well. Can you speak a little bit about that? I mean, Renee hit it on, on, on the head. I mean, it's these kind of inner, inner collaborations that we need to look, look towards. If I'd say if, we're, if our end goal is to just build the building or kind of think about a structure as an end goal, then I think we've missed the point. Uh, I, it is much more about that kind of uh, the complexity of the process to kind of solve a solution that is important for us to lift up, right? And I think 
ways in which we can use our design education and we can use our planning education and our kind of connection to communities to design processes that have outcomes that are healing. So does that mean we have to bring in doctors? Does that mean we have to bring in archaeologists and historians to kind of uncover and, and allow us to kind of move forward in a, in a better way, then that's the process that we need to design. I think historically, uh, when we think about policies, when we think about uh, health practices, when we think about economic development strategies, those are, are systems that have been designed and, and have failed the populations that we're currently working with. And so how do we as uh, planners, designers, redesign those systems so that whatever uh, we're thinking is the kind of future built environment is kind of moving forward in a positive way. Then I think we're moving towards some semblance of, of, uh, of, of prosperity, I, I'd say. And this notion of kind of not, we can't engineer our way out of this is really kind of uh, coming from this notion of maybe some of the current kind of language that we've been using in some of our projects around sustainability, right? Who gets to define sustainability? Uh, and what is sustainable to your own community, right? And, and in some instances, it might be cultural sustainability, it might be economic sustainability. Uh, and so uh, and inevitably, I, I, uh, some of the conversations that we have, it's like, what does sustainability mean to you? And how do you define it? And how can we work collaboratively to kind of achieve what that looks like for, for your community? And I'd say that in, in, in some ways, we need to kind of work collaboratively to redefine some of the language, languages that we're using around design, around planning, around, around this work, because uh, it's only until we can uh, redefine that in, in some semblance of a way that we can move forward so that we're working collectively and collaboratively with our partners. Um. Yeah, maybe uh, extending this conversation a little bit. Um, can you guys maybe speak a little bit about agency? Uh, what, is, what is the agency of the community in relation to the agency of the urban designer slash architect in relation to the agency of a potential investor, let's say, uh, and, some, and, and some of these sites? Well, the agency that we decided to use was this um, design competition, all right? That is where we got ideas from the community. We put them on paper. So our agency, you know, happens to be competition programming as a tool for discussion. I mean, that's that common piece of paper that the community gets to input on because it's tied to their master plan. Uh, that the program for the 16 venues gets to basically suck in and interpret. And, you know, that becomes kind of a lingua franca. And at the end of the day, this gets presented, the same piece of paper, the same tool, uh, the same transformative opus gets to be presented to investors to look at the many ways in which a, a similar problem, you know, can be solved. So, we have looked at the competition as the agency that kind of supersedes personality and it also supersedes any one singular thought about how things could be. Uh, when I worked at the Endowment of the Arts, I actually was a director of national design competitions. So I'm a big believer in what they can do. And one of the things we used to say about design competitions as an agency, was that design competitions is one way, we have a whole bunch of tools as architects and planners, but that's one way that can be used to raise public awareness about a number of issues that will extract a number of solutions rather than there's only one way to do things. That's the agency that we use, multiplicity as an agency through uh, competitive ideas. Joseph, you have any thoughts? For sure. Uh, I, I mean, that, that, that idea of kind of translating that power, I think, is important. And so a lot of the times when we're working with community, and this is kind of a semblance, this has come out of some of the work that we've done uh, in Indian country. It's how are we kind of ensuring that the community is the architect of their own vision and ensuring that that vision is a long-term commitment to change. 
and, and ensuring that when we're, we're thinking about that vision, that everybody is part of that conversation. And that is part of the engagement process. And so empowering individuals to be part of the process and understand the power of design and that, and to inevitably kind of ensure that that vision is held by the community, right? Inevitably, we as designers, architects, planners, engineers are going to leave unless we are literally a community member in that community. And so that vision inevitably has to be uh, instilled within the community. And that's kind of giving over agency to the, to the, to the community so that they can mentor and kind of uh, ensure that this process moves forward in a productive way. And I, I think that uh, in, in many ways can be uh, empowering. That is a, that's a transition of agency. That is a, a transition of power um, and allowing us as professionals to kind of ensure that we're, we're doing our job. We're not going to be there. And I, I, with one of the first communities that I've worked with, I knew I wasn't going to be there, right? I had to inevitably work myself out of a job because uh, I knew if I, if I became a crutch within the community, I wasn't doing my job. And so how could we transition that agency, transition that power so that they become part of the, uh, they, they lead the process in their own right. And they know how to hire good designers. They know how to hire good planners. Maybe I would be part of that team in the future, maybe not, and that's okay. And so that is, I think, this idea of, of building agency, building power within the communities that we work and, and you know, we have to continue doing that. And that's, that's the citizen architect. That's the kind of, that's the, the, the model of architecture serving society in, in many ways. So we have uh, two more minutes um, left. <laughs> so I thought maybe we can end by uh, speaking a little bit about joy. Um, how does joy factor in to the work that both of you are doing? Wow, we don't say that word enough, I can tell you that. Um, well, I, I, I think there is a joy that comes through being invited into a community and the community over time learns to trust you because of your heart space your head space, your hand space, your mind space. One of the biggest joys that um, befell us in terms of this competition was when uh, Joe Womack, we call him the Minister of Information for Africatown, <laughs> when Joe Womack and also Anderson Flynn, uh, co-founders of the Heritage Foundation, insisted that Vicki Howell and I uh, participate in a community-wide um, meeting where 200 people came to the community center and we were allowed, we had to ask permission to share the competition idea to the elders. And it had to be voted on unanimously by the community as to whether this idea in our head with lots of PowerPoint pictures, you know, was going to be sanctioned, approved and supported by the community. And my heart still sings at being given the chance to share the idea and also when I saw the hands go up that basically said, we trust you, we see what you are doing, it will benefit us. That was, that was joy, that was purity joy. And then to be invited back on a consistent basis and then called by community members now when there's a birth or a death, you know, that notion of the building of trust where we all share in the joy of, 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 of our common humanity you know, that's when you can see that the ball is moving in terms of, you know, the kind of transformational power that design can have is, yeah. is just a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Joseph, can you reflect on joy? Really quickly. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, building on that, uh, Renee's comments, it's, it's knowing that you've kind of moved the conversation forward, that what you have kind of seeded is now part of a community conversation that uh, that they can can describe these processes and the power of design in their own words, and and that brings me joy. Right, that we need an architect. That, that this is this is like empowering. And I think in the end, like being invited back to the community, being part of that community, uh, being adopted into that community. Like that, that just kind of is, is from a kind of personal perspective that, that, that I think brings joy to, to, to me and to the, I think those that I work with knowing that 
uh, we they they want us to be part of the process and and, and know the power that uh, that design brings to to a project. Yes. Uh, well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Renee. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Um, but also, thank you so much for sharing your work. Obviously, you're both developing projects that will require endless collective imagination. Uh, so I'm really excited to see what happens after uh, this discussion as well. Thank, thank you, you for so spending time with us. us. And we want to thank the Africatown community for being such yes. warriors. We love you dearly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to Emmanuel and Renee and Joseph um, for that conversation. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't have imagined anyone who could have brought together those themes and ideas um, better than Emmanuel. So thank you so much. Um, I'm sure there's many things that we'll be revisiting um, over the coming days and weeks. Um, in this session, technology, uh, we are uh, really excited to be presenting an idea that I've been super interested in at the world around for, for a long time, which is the relationship between technology and land. Um, and we'll be looking at different scales from handheld devices to gigantic infrastructures um, that will utilize future technologies um, using landscapes across the Americas. As the people that we'll be presenting um, will discuss that the, these types of connections and relationships um, are, are on us as designers and people in the design community to make the most of. First of all, we'll be hearing from the artist Simon Denny, an international figure who's been exploring these ideas between technology and technologists, um, relationships between labor practices, territories, um, and infrastructures. And then we'll be, um, and also he'll be presenting um, his recent exhibition, Proof of Stake. Um, and then following that, we'll have a presentation by Holly Jean Buck, who is an academic, a researcher, um, and a writer, and her work will be, it's, um, it's an opportunity to think about the really big picture of technology and infrastructure and land, and how to find and, and, and whittle down some of these extremely complicated ideas um, into an accessible format. Um, these two different scales and different individuals um, will come together in a live conversation following the presentations, moderated by Luisa Prado de Oliveras de Martins. Um, thank you so much um, to Luisa for moderating this session. Um, she's an artist and a researcher based in Berlin. And um, we'll be also hoping to have more of your questions from the audience. Um, we really enjoyed the debate and discussion that we had um, during the first session. Um, after this presentation, we'll be um, wrapping up with ecology. And so I will see you again in one hour. So thanks for watching and enjoy. Um, over to Simon Denny. I'm Simon Denny, here in Berlin, in my studio. I make exhibitions and projects about technology, technologists, people that make technology, the promises and visions of those people, and how that plays out for other people. Also, property uh, and ownership and connection to other things that make technological objects, like resources from the ground and uh, minerals. So I'm really interested in the way that land is framed, interpreted, and kind of used. I guess my work is always focused on trying to foreground how material these things are, who makes it, what's it made from, also how they're connected to where we live and how we live. One doesn't necessarily think of the earth uh, when one looks at one's iPhone or when one is buying a cryptocurrency. When you have a, a Mac in your hand, the minerals would make up the components of that and the labor and all of the other things that make these objects are, you know, uh, very much in specific locations in specific parts of the world. Many minerals that come out of the ground in uh, remote parts of Australia that go into those phones, for example, but also from Africa, different parts of the continent, like the Congo. So the people that design the objects, often they're living in California. The people that, you know, extract the raw minerals uh, for those objects are often in very different parts of the globe. 
When I made a recent project, mine, uh, which looked at the context of extraction from minerals to data, one of the sculptural gestures that I was interested in working with was uh, making one-to-one -one sized uh, portraits of machines used for mining minerals. And the mining industry is more and more automated these days. There's fewer and fewer people involved in the labor of extraction. And there are uh, proliferations of these kinds of vast, for a human scale, uh, machines, um, which are very heavy. They're often made of steel and you know, big, loud, uh, chunky machinery. I wanted to make a translation that uh, focused on what these machines do, also connecting them to the more user-based end and, and the rest of the industries. One can imagine a very near future when one person can own a whole mine and nobody else works there, which I think is a really stark contrast to what we think of mining in the past, especially if you think about industrial action and the history of kind of like the struggle between like labor and capital. I recently made an exhibition called Proof of Stake, which is at the Kunstverein in Hamburg. It's an exhibition that tries to unpack some of the context around blockchains and artists working with blockchains, but also some of the themes that blockchains have brought to the fore of discussion around technology. Proof of Stake is the name of a blockchain consensus mechanism, uh, which is core to the way that blockchains work that moves away from uh, energy intensive um, ways of working that uh, rely on heavy amounts of processing power towards instead other ways of distributing power within the network that is based on who owns what part of the network. So the idea that ownership equals power, it really uh, brings to the foreground these questions about who gets to own what type of properties and, and what uh, infrastructure does to the structure of ownership and value, uh, which I think is really relevant in blockchains. There's been a lot of discussion around the amount of power, uh, the amount of electronic processing power that is used um, to run these systems and therefore to support the distribution of NFTs and, and other blockchain-based assets. It's an interesting debate because uh, there's a history to talking about the uh, uh, the amount of power that is used um, to uh, power any type of infrastructure. Um, and for me, that's really interesting to think about, again, in the context of uh, both you know, mineral extraction and the way that land is then framed as resources in order to be put into industrial systems of extraction, but also the role of art in framing things as assets to be um, you know, uh, p distributed in particular ways. So landscape painting, topographical painting that is sort of canonized as you know, European white uh, art history in New Zealand um, is also a tool for framing land use as resources and as commodity. And maybe we can think about other ways in which um, you know, the framing of cultural products uh, is also producing a particular type of possibility for assets and therefore um, of a particular commercial frame for, yeah, value um, in, a, in a broader sense. And the people who are um, in charge of designing those systems and I guess enforcing and, and producing those ways of seeing uh, landscapes, um, be they the metaverse virtual landscapes or, you know, very uh, material um, ver versions of uh, landscapes, which I think uh, artists um, are processing and thinking about in really amazing ways. I'm Holly Jean Buck. I am a writer and a geographer and an environmental social scientist, broadly working on environment and sustainability. Very specifically, thinking about removing carbon from the atmosphere. We have all of these technical solutions. We have roadmaps. We know what we need to do to address climate change, but we're not because of social structures. So that's like the big wicked problem. On a basic level, I wanted this book to be an introduction to both the carbon removal methods and the solar geoengineering techniques that are being researched. Geoengineering is a big umbrella term that includes anything that is large scale, like planetary scale, going to have a planetary impact, and intentional. So people talk about 
things like solar geoengineering that is reflecting some amount of incoming sunlight back up into space to cool the planet. That would be intentional and planetary. People also talk about removing carbon from the atmosphere or carbon removal, which would be intentional and could be planetary if it was done by enough people in enough places. It feels familiar to say that, you know, we're going to use technology to address climate change. And if we have a standpoint that's not just putting on like our special carbon glasses and seeing all the carbon flows, if we can put that aside and say, okay, who are the users of this land starting point, I think can be really generative in getting to better case implementations of these technologies. So net zero means some amount of positive emissions that's balanced by some amount of negative emissions. Why do we even have any positive emissions, right? Um, and the reason is basically we don't have quite all the technology that we need to be fully decarbonized. There's some things like decarbonizing agriculture, fertilizer production, aviation and shipping are challenging. You know, we're going to have to build up this whole new hydrogen infrastructure. We're just behind on all of this stuff, right? We need to electrify everything, increasing solar capacity, building offshore wind, investing in geothermal. And then once we decarbonize electricity, we have to think about outfitting cement and steel and other types of industrial facilities with carbon capture and storage to decarbonize industry. The solutions exist, but we need support for them, and we're not going to get support unless we're talking about doing them right, because there's definitely a right way and a wrong way to implement any of these things. I mean, even something that might sound as good as planting a forest might not be good if that's land used by somebody for something that's important, whether that's you know their own land um, traditionally, or if it's used for food, you don't want to say, okay, sorry, carbon needs come first. And so if communities aren't engaged in that or leading that work, it won't necessarily work over time. A lot of these communities are depopulating and, you know, manufacturing has left, agriculture has shrunk and employs less people. They're wondering what's going to be the economic basis for our town. Are our aquifers going to be depleted? People have a lot of environmental questions that aren't always framed in, in terms of climate change or the way people in coastal cities might frame them. But with carbon removal at scale, um, both industrial and you know, agricultural-based, land-based, methods could really bring more investment and support to these communities if they're designed well. So design is one of the places where infrastructure and culture are meeting, and that intersection is critical because we really want people to be desiring this new infrastructure and supporting it because it is going to have a cost, it is going to be a departure, and you know, without that demand, it won't work. So designers have a huge role in um, being a bridge between, you know, users or communities or however you want to talk about them and um, engineers. Designers are going to be better trained if they're thinking more holistically. I also think that architecture has concentrated a lot on the urban as a site and we need to also be thinking about you know, rural design, because that's where these solutions take place. That's where renewable energy is deployed. Sure, some of it will be in the cities, but a lot of it will be in rural areas. Um, and these are the areas we need to revitalize too. It's really a conversation that needs to include everybody working together. And right now, people in the global south are mostly left out of a lot of this. So we're not even part way to getting everybody we need to build these solutions in ways that'll be robust. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can talk about things like carbon removal or even the land required for renewables, which is also huge, without talking about land and land back and 
indigenous communities, I think meaningful engagement needs to be defined by the communities, not by, you know, the outsiders that are hoping for the engagement. We have a huge historical responsibility in the United States for all these legacy emissions. So if we have the technology to start cleaning some of that up, we should be doing that. Hi everyone, thank you for being here and following the programming with us. My name is Luisa and I'm really, really happy to have Holly and Simon here with us today. Um, thank you both uh, for being panelists here and thank you to the Guggenheim for inviting. Um, I wanted to start this panel um, by thinking or since we're talking about land and technology and ecology uh, today, I wanted to start this panel with a prompt and to and a reflection. So a critical and urgent way to think about technology is through its relationship to land. And here we're understanding technology in a broad sense, right? Something that spans the sector itself, the resources that are needed to build each product, the planetary conditions and contexts that technology has enabled and engendered. In the context of the dramatic political, environmental and cultural changes triggered by technology and its related practices and products in the past decades. And I would say perhaps particularly since the turn of the 21st century, some sectors of society have become increasingly resistant to how the technology industry has benefited from a continuum of extractivism and violence that stretches back hundreds of years and includes today's practices of land grabbing, land buybacks, mineral mining, pollution, and more. Practices that stretch, um, as, we, as I was saying, um, through hundreds of years. So, over the past few years, scholars, um, for instance, Michelle Murphy or Kim Talbert, have extensively discussed how the destruction of land and body relations constitute a form of colonial violence and a form of violence that disrupts um, these relationships, not only in the, in let's say the material sense, um, but, um, that disrupt also, uh, that have intergenerational effects, that have effects that accumulate throughout generations. Um, and these, and according to, uh, for instance, Michelle Murphy, whom I just mentioned, um, these, uh, these forms of colonial environmental violences are made possible by a, a regulatory regime that understands that there, is, there are acceptable levels of pollution and that therefore grants uh, permission to pollute um, to certain bodies, certain sectors like the technology sector, for instance. Um, and uh, particularly, I think it's very interesting to think about how this regime that understands that, um, that there are these acceptable levels of pollution have uh, to, to think about the, the cultural effects of that, the political effects um, of these, these practices and particularly how they affect uh, indigenous black and brown communities. So um, drawing on that, I was thinking we could start our conversation with some reflections from both of you. Um, but I think this particularly, uh, perhaps let's start with Holly, um, about how you have dealt with uh, the relations between land and, uh, and ecology and technology in your work. Um, Holly, in particular, let's start with you, as I said. Um, in your recent book, After Geoengineering, Climate Tragedy, Repair and Restoration, I was really struck by the descriptions of sites you visited. 
And I wanted to ask to start this conversation, how have the relations between land and technology informed your work? Yeah, thank you for that uh, question. You know, I think that we have to step back and also think about capitalism so that it, it operates by expropriating value from both workers and land. It relies on cheapening labor and cheapening land, right? And so that relationship between land and technology is totally mediated by capitalism, which is so hegemonic that people sometimes see technology as kind of a stand-in for capital. And it's really hard to imagine a non-capitalist or non-extractivist relationship between technology and land. There just aren't very many familiar models for it. And so then I think what happens is that we don't consider how technologies could work with the land or with ecosystems for aims of restoration or regeneration because they're already associated with these capitalist forces of degradation. Um, we also don't think about you know, how they could produce new social relations. And it's a huge missed opportunity really because the ecological devastation we're facing actually, I, I would argue needs technology. We do need renewable energy at scale as well as other decarbonization technologies. It's going to require some extraction. It's going to require land. So we have to figure out how to use these technologies with different sets of social relations even though we have very few models that help us imagine what that might look like. So that's part of my project, <laughs> you know, part of the way there, it's a big challenge. Thank you, that's very, very important. I think uh, particularly this distinction between capitalism and, and technology and understanding that these things are, are, um, are yeah, this, uh, distinct concepts is yep. super, super important. And I think it also perhaps relates to Simon's work and how you've created a number of uh, exhibition projects on mining from resource extraction to data mining. And perhaps that's a nice thread for, for you to explore. Yes, thanks so much. And thanks also to the organizers of this event. It's a really special thing to be a part of and be watching along also the other previous panels that was really compelling material. So congratulations for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think maybe to add on to Holly's, uh, yeah, really, um, uh, yeah, urgent uh, distinction there, there's maybe another distinction which relates to uh, the curatorial project I mentioned in the video, um, Proof of Stake, uh, which talks about yeah, imagining mining through other metaphors that are often used in particular types of technology, blockchain technology, um, and trying to uh, unpack those a little bit. Because I think when I was curating this exhibition, I was thinking also about like who gets to claim what technology is. And, and maybe that's another important distinction to make around, um, you know, if we're gonna kind of uh, separate technology from capitalism, maybe we also get to question what is, called technology um, and, you know, uh, I think in my own work, uh, one of the ways which I have tried to focus on that is to um, look instead at um, uh, at industry, you know, and maybe that's another another way of, um, of, of speaking to technology. So a lot of the, a lot of the work that I did in the, in the mine projects um, and in proof of stake was to look at the rhetoric of ind industry and the claims of industry and a particular type of industry done by particular kinds of people, um, which I think is different than uh, technology as a whole. Um, uh, yeah, so maybe that's something I can say. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Holly, do you have anything else to say or can we move on, think about something else? Well, let's keep going. I mean, I'm sure we'll come back to these really big picture questions. Okay, so maybe moving on, um, I wanted to ask you, so for many people whose worlds are in close proximity to climate science and policy, the question at the moment is not if societies will decarbonize, but how. And 
the question is, what are some of the considerations needed for fair and just pathways? And here, I think it's important to make a distinction between a, a techno-solutionist approach that claims to fix um, climate breakdown and other modes of repair and suggests that the how is more to do with social, political, or organizational dynamics such as asymmetric um, power relations and competing visions of more and just equitable futures. And this is obviously a question for both of you, but I think Holly, uh, I think your work really relates to that. And um, particularly, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the considerations that uh, you know, maybe building also on, on the conversation that we started, what are some of the considerations needed for fair and just pathways? Yeah, so before I talk about those considerations, which, which are at the heart of it all, I also want to point out that sometimes things that sound like they would be a technical fix or look like one actually have really deep political and social considerations right underneath the surface. And that's because capitalism is, is really not adequate at delivering some of these technical fixes. So looking at some of the decarbonization roadmaps, they rely on pretty massive layouts of new technologies, new infrastructures. It looks like a technical fix because it's on a graph or in a model, but to get to that level, we need really deep social change to finance, permit, build, all of the stuff. Um, and it's just not happening as we, we can see, right? So something like carbon capture and storage looks like a technical fix. Capitalism has not delivered this. This technology has existed for decades and we still have you know, around 20 facilities for it around the world instead of you know the hundreds that some of these technocrats predicted we would need. Um, we're just not getting there without the social transformation. So in terms of what's needed for fair and just pathways um, for decarbonization broadly, I think we can look you know, at, at distributive justice. So first analyzing really honestly where the harms are, who they fall upon, but also who the benefits are flowing to, and then crafting policy to address that and to make sure environmental justice communities get the benefits from this transition. So, you know, in the US, we have the Justice 40 initiative, we have some um, programs and campaigns for that. And then we also have to look at procedural justice. So who's at the table, who's making decisions? Are people able to participate? And I think that a just pathway would really fund people in civil society to participate in decision making. So it's really hard. You know, some pe sometimes there are public hearings or, you know, for permits or stuff like that, but people can't really use those me mechanisms to participate meaningfully if they're working all the time or they don't have the transportation to get there or it's not in their language. So there's a whole lot that the government could be doing um, to facilitate deeper public engagement and procedural justice. And then I also think that the dimension of recognition justice is important. So do the frameworks and discussions taking place really incorporate the values of people who are affected, the particulars of their situations? Those are just a few of the considerations I think we need to be bringing up more and more. And the environmental justice community is doing this. Thank you, Holly. That's. Uh... That's a really, really interesting approach. And um, following up, I wanted to ask also Simon, if you have anything to, to add here. Um, you've engaged a generation of artists and creative people to think in more complex and circuitous ways that um, new technologies like blockchain or crypto um, organize people, power or ability to make decisions. And I was wondering if you could tell us, uh, tell us about how you see a pathway to decarbonization in relation to technology. Sure. Um, I mean, a lot of what Holly said uh, seems to um, cover some of this, but certainly speaking um, to the blockchain context in particular, I mean, uh, 
the what I mean, it's hard to kind of make monolithic statements about something which is quite uh, disparate in the way that it's applied. Um, but, uh, you know, the claim of Web3 and um, blockchains is that it's about using, um, I guess, capital and redesigning it where it's applied and who gets access to it and who um, is able to be compensated financially or have a stake in projects. So it's about incentive design. And I think um, this is not outside of capitalism. It's kind of a rejig of capitalism um, in a particular way. So I wonder what Holly would think about that as well. Um, uh, but there are, for example, uh, projects on blockchains like the Regan network, which is a sort of a, a blockchain focused um, uh, project that allows kind of local confederate sees of uh, groups of people to come together and say, hey, we want to do, a, for example, a rewilding project of this particular space. Um, and we want to have um, guidance and approval by people who are part of another network. And you can set up, um, yeah, uh, uh, tokens that support those systems within that network. Um, that's one, one way that's being done. There's other more poetic things artists, for example, that I've worked with, um, there's a group called um, Terra Zero, um, which uh, designed a, a project where um, blockchain systems enabled a forest or are enabling a forest to own itself, um, essentially. So through a series of smart contracts, um, uh, an industrial forest can, for example, um, claim the uh, capital that it's producing um and so that's again like a redefinition of who owns what uh, obviously that's a uh, a kind of proof of concept for a particular type of financial infrastructure um and there are other ways that it could be applied um beyond there as well so maybe that's something thank you that's really really interesting because i think it taps also into um questions that that um, Holly brought up in her in her answer also thinking about the limitations right of our understanding of decarbonization and um, what are the fundamental limitations that we're dealing with here um, is there is there anything you would like to respond to this Holly I mean in terms of what the limitations to decarbonization are I think that um, I think that they're, they're pretty well known. I mean, vested interests blocking it or slowing it down, um, financing challenges, social acceptance, social knowledge about the problem and the scale of interventions that are needed to deal with it. Um, and just the lack of trust in society because, you know, uh, people have not been included in much of the decision making to date and, and um, you know it's deeply unequal so you know why should a community trust project developers just because their thing is green I mean there's no guarantee that the benefits will flow to them so I think that's you know a really important underlying challenge and it's interesting about the blockchain um, like I understand the value in terms of harnessing a joint intention, as Adam Greenfield has put it. Um, but then sometimes I wonder if it's kind of a techno fix for these problems of trust or for collaboration. Like, could we just develop trust by talking to each other and doing nice things for each other? Or do we do we really need, uh, you know, the blockchain stuff for that? But, but I find it very interesting. I mean, it's built from a particular set of I mean, originally, whatever, but like a lot of the origins of these kinds of system designs come from a particular ideological, you know, position as well. And so I think um, certainly the Bitcoin blockchain and when that was uh, in invented, so to speak, um, or whatever, unleashed, uh, it came from a like a very particular ideological position, which is not, you know, which doesn't even necessarily uh, include those ideas of like, uh, it, it, like it's aiming for a trustless world. Uh, it's where you don't have to interact with people. You don't have to trust the people you're transacting with, which has an ideological backdrop to it, which I think can be questioned. Um, 
I think now that it's out there in the world, uh, I think there are people trying to do different things with it um, than the same ideological position from which it was designed from. And maybe that's true with other technologies as well um, and other industrial products. Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting space. Thank you. Yeah, I was also thinking about um, how then will the technology for carbon capture and sequestration be scaled within this context that we're discussing here? Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I think that we will see some development in, in Europe. I think that there's a lot in the infrastructure and budget legislation in the US that's being debated right now that will kind of determine what its fate is here, at least in the, the short term. Um, but really, you know, you can think about, okay, it needs a price on carbon. That's the conventional wisdom. You could also think about regulatory approaches. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it's possible, but we have to really up our ambition on climate across the board. And I think that for, you know, people have been thinking about carbon capture as an add-on to fossil fuel powered plants, but really the need is for industrial decarbonization. So things like cement and steel making, it, it's the best way to decarbonize these, you know, <laughs> speaking to, to architects, right? You, we, we will need steel and cement, right? So um, I think, people are understanding that role in industrial de decarbonization. And if we get serious on climate, then that's gonna be one piece of it is the carbon capture and storage there. Someone, any thoughts or can we? Uh... I, I think Holly uh, said, said it all. Okay, yeah. Definitely, and I think particularly thinking about uh, regulatory practices, um, I was also thinking about how we're days away right now from uh, COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. And I'm thinking about how there are many natural pursuits of green energy, green technology, and many criticisms about what those plans are a continuation of, particularly in, um, to, to be clear, in the context of neoliberal or colonial agendas. And Holly, you've mentioned in your work, nationalizing carbon capture. And Simon, you've been critical of Adani mining and who tells that story. So from your own work, do you have any reflections about national level approaches to share? And could you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. I mean, you know, I'd say that these neoliberal or colonial agendas are the dominant approach to green technology. Um, but there is a lot of discussion about alternative frameworks, whether that comes in the form of the energy democracy movement or technology in the public interest. Um, I think that a lot of this is going to fall under national level policy, but international organizations have some role in terms of setting out the methodologies for carbon, setting up these carbon accounting schemes. So there's a lot of this um, carbon logics that is kind of like the dominant form, right? Um, because these net zero goals, people all around the world have committed to net zero in, in com countries, companies, cities. And that implies balancing some amount of continued emissions with some amount of removals or negative emissions. And so one key question there is what's, um, you know, what's the platform for exchanging all that? How is that accounting being done? Can we imagine a public sector platform that doesn't have finance capital taking a cut out of these transactions, that doesn't have finance capital speculating on these carbon futures? It's really transparent and, um, you know, accountable for people. Maybe blockchain is part of that. I, I don't haven't decided what I think about that, but people are arguing that too, right? Because there's a lot of fraud in these carbon markets, a lot of errors. They have a terrible history. So, um, 
you know, there's a technological infrastructure for making that better, but there's also a regulatory one, right? Yeah, and I think that, I mean, where blockchains might be able to come in is, is, is redesigning how capital behaves in theory, right? That's the, again, the claim of what it does and that whom it, whom it and, uh, can benefit. Um, and, you know, so if you have, a, uh, for example, a, I guess like a, a project like this that then is able to also be accompanied by um, uh, a design where the speculative, uh, I guess, um, like attention gets to then, you know, the capital that comes with speculative attention gets to flow back into funding these schemes. That's where, I guess, Web3 claims that it could, you know, help. Um, again, yet to be proven. Yeah, for sure. And I think that also kind of flows nicely into my next question, um, which is thinking that um, in 2021, a powerful and complex place we find ourselves in is in as a planet, um, is that data and information have tended to be a key way to sort out the world. And this is currently being applied to carbon emissions from carbon offsetting markets and credits to a swathe of research projects that measure the carbon output of our internet usage, cookies, data centers, and underwater cables. There's lots of different ways that our individual and collective carbon emissions are measured. And with it comes a, a set of emergent tensions around limitations on the categories we place on things, moralism, as well as personal doubts about their effectiveness and agency. And one recent example of that is a revelation that many tree planting projects linked to carbon credits are abandoned not looked after or create more carbon emissions than they are expected to reduce. And this speaks to the entanglement of our actions within wider systems and that often we do not know the future of these projects. And I think that we here perhaps needs to be localized, right? Um, I think I'm speaking, I'm aware that I'm speaking within an institution located in the global North coming from the global South as I do you know that these projects end up like this because it is something that has happened repeatedly for 500 years. This is not um, a news to everyone. But um, I'm thinking um, in, in this question, what I wanna do is to kind of um, understand the balance or, or uh, position questions of uncertainty and individual accountability and responsibility. And here, um, uh, as a, a direct prompt, Holly, uh, as you have a book coming out on net zero, maybe you would like to kind of start us off on these reflections. Sure, I'll start out by just saying that, you know, one problem with net zero is that it takes the focus off of producing fossil fuels and it focuses our attention after the point of combustion on emissions. And so it focuses towards, you know, individual consumers. And I think it's, you know, neoliberal, neoliberal trap in that way where, I mean, we are some in some ways accountable for our emissions, but we also know that there's deep structural factors that condition how much we can change and how. Um, and so we, my book is called Ending Fossil Fuels because we need to focus back on production. So acknowledging that, you know, what do we do about the, the emissions? Like you said, the carbon markets and credits are kind of a disaster. Um, and part of it is these bureaucratic systems. So anthropologists Sarah Milne and Sango Mahanti have a great uh, anthropological analysis of work they did in Cambodia around forest carbon schemes. And they refer to this as bureaucratic violence. It, they trace the ways these systems of validation and verification for carbon credits, um, you know, they commodify carbon and they produce value out of that land, 
like a measurable unit of tradable value. But in order to get those accreditations, the projects have to do things like exclude lands with indigenous communal title, because that title to the indigenous people that live there is seen as a risk to the permanence of the carbon. So these systems are kind of set up to work against human values and concerns because they're accountable to whomever buys that carbon credit. The communities are part of the picture, even when there are these um, so-called communi climate, community, and biodiversity standards. People in voluntary carbon markets have tried to kind of produce better standards, but they're still not delivering just because of the underlying logics in many cases. So can we imagine something better? I think yes, but let's also focus on the production side of it too. From, from the non-production side, perhaps, in, perhaps another um, connection to an artist project that I think is um, uh, addressing this in some ways, also quite close to the Guggenheim is, uh, there's a project called Art into Acres, which is focusing on long-term conservation as a way of um, working with artists who want to, um, or museums or uh, um, uh, other arts organizations who want to kind of commit to um, while producing, also um, doing other things. So maybe this is part of the problem, but I think, um, uh, yeah, this artist Haley Mellon has set up this really interesting thing. And for example, for the Rem Coolhouse show, I know that she uh, worked with the Guggenheim to uh, produce some kind of long-term conservation at the same time as the show was being produced, which I thought was really interesting. And um, yeah, certainly something that's happening in the art world as we speak, uh, that is one of the first things to try and address uh, these types of things um, in, in, a, in ways that have like long-term impacts. Okay, yeah, I was precisely going to ask you, Simon, how do accountability and responsibility feature in your own work that tends to often use tools, technologies, and systems that it is critiquing? Sure, yeah, I, I mean, you know, uh, my work is exploring um, and kind of trying to, uh, I guess, take a um, second look at some of the claims of uh, the industries that we are all kind of, as Holly mentioned, structurally forced to interact with, right? Um, so it's very hard to, from an individual agent side, you know, withdraw from participating in this material. And I think that's where my uh, work starts, um, but it also start, tries to ask questions about things and, and slightly shift the focus from, uh, the agenda that's set by the rhetoric of the industry and trying to kind of use some of that um, uh, to ask adjacent questions which are somehow obscured. Um, so, I mean, in the mine project, for example, uh, I made these sculptures of kind of large uh, industrial automated and extraction machines, uh, which are kind of very involved in, in all of in the, in the production side of all of these things. Um, and, uh, but I also commissioned um, some drawings um, from a uh, courtroom sketch artist that works um, in Brisbane. Uh, she's been working in courts for 30 years and uh, I asked her to make speculative sketches of um, the people in, at the helm of some of these industrial products um, as if they were in courtroom environments. Um, which has happened actually in Australia uh, recently. Um, Rio Tinto has been on trial for some of the things that we've been talking about, um, especially as it interacts with the indigenous land, um, which it does a lot, mining there, of course. Um, and uh, it's an inter they're, they're interesting objects to kind of like look at because it's also kind of improbable that the courts that nation state systems that are of course connected to colonial histories and structures would be calling into question the accountability of their own actors in a way, because of course, industrial and commercial actors are, you know, working hand in hand with the state and have been since the state was uh, imposed in Australia. Um, so yeah, that's some of the ways that I touch on some of those subjects in my work. Thank you, Simon. Um, 
that's really really interesting and i love the 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 speculation also and the 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 trigger to imagining these particular actors um, that have such a massive impact in the planet and in how we relate to it being put in that spot in that position super super interesting to to think about that yeah i mean to, as i say it's so improbable that it would do anything or that it that, because it's sort of like i don't know it's kind of like that spider-man meme where they're all pointing at each other but I don't know. <laughs> yeah and this is something that also as in speaking as an artist it's something that i really appreciate about the the way that art gives you a space to think about these issues through um also um an understanding of of the complexity of it obviously but also an understanding or or a space to to um reflect on even how sometimes we're so entangled in these very issues that we're critiquing um, that, you know, <laughs> we become the Spider-Man meme. And, and to understand that this does not, um, and I think this is important to say, this does not remove the power of the critique, but instead I think it also um, actually highlights it, how, deeply implicated i mean we are having this conversation through what you know where is this conversation even happening um through the use of a number of artifacts um i'm in europe uh you're also in europe uh simon holly um you're in the united states right so even just the fact that we are here speaking and talking about these things by using the very tools that we're discussing and we're thinking about um, their impact in our lives and in, um, in the ways that we have to relate to one another, to land, to the planet, to political systems um, and to historical processes too. And I keep bringing historical processes up because I think it's also super important to, um, to kind of position and localize these conversations within a continuum uh, of coloniality. Do you have any further comments on, on this? Or maybe let's move on to the next question, um, which I think is also uh, quite interesting and um, really relates to to what we're talking about here. So um, in recent months, that's been there's been a lot of debate in digital art and design circles about NFTs, which is a format for artists to um, sell their work online directly to anyone worldwide. And NFTs have been criticized for a number of things from adding disproportionately to people's carbon footprint to the perpetuation of exhaustive and exploitative structures of art and labor. And this is a question more for Simon. Um, I know that you use, or we start with Simon. I know that you use your, um, you use NFT in your most recent project. So could you tell us a little bit more about um, what this is and the reality that they could provide? Yeah, I mean, I think the NFT context for art is really interesting. Um, also in terms of the way that, again, it's about, um, I mean, the, again, the claim of the promise of it is about re being able to redefine how assets move around and how, you know, uh, money uh, behaves um, in art. And I think one of the amazing things which has been talked about that has happened really in an interesting way um, to change how artwork is produced and distributed with NFTs is that um, something that was proposed by a lot of people, but also by conceptual artists in the 60s um, uh, to have a, a resale um, contract uh, written into secondary uh, resales where an artist would get a royalty um, when a work is sold. So when kind of secondary value was produced, then there's a way to kind of like hold that um, and, and uh, 
get access to that um, for the person who created the work. Um, and people have tried to do that in contemporary art context for a while, but it's never really functioned. And uh, it's become a norm uh, in NFTs um, to have an automated part of the contract on resale to automatically deliver um, some of that value back on, on resale. Um, and that's changed the way that artists make work for those environments because the interests of the collector and the interests of the artists are more aligned, like in the traditional art world. The ideal situation for me would be to create a, a unique work, send it to uh, a collector, hopefully a museum, and then to never sell it again and you know uh, keep it forever. Um, in the NFT world, uh, both the artist and the collector want it to be resold and continue to uh, kind of uh, move around commercially, um, and that that just makes very very different kinds of artwork possible and very different types of projects design. Um, and with regards to the question of um, uh, energy production and energy use um, in uh, NFT infrastructure and blockchain infrastructure in general, I think there's a lot of confusion around this. There's been a real difficulty in measuring this because what do you measure? Um, number one, what do you measure in terms of which energy is associated with, you know, from an artist's perspective, producing and storing an asset is actually quite a small amount of energy used um, on a blockchain, even on a proof of work blockchain, which is the kind of more energy intensive blockchains um, like Bitcoin and Ethereum currently use. Um, Ethereum being the main uh, blockchain network that is used for NFTs, the main marketplace is happening there. Um, but uh, actually it's, uh, it's more in the, um, the production and distribution of ether, the, the currency that is used on Ethereum. Um, so without going into too much detail, actually the more expensive an NFT is, the more energy use it has because it, it consumes more um, power to uh, make and uh, move around um, the, the currency that, that buys it. Um, but even, even in that context, uh, Ethereum is moving towards proof of stake, uh, which is this other less energy uh, intensive uh, way of producing blockchains. Um, but you also lose something with that. Uh, the proof of work blockchain is designed to, um, uh, yeah, produce a particular sort of incentive structure for production and, and um, of, of, of value, um, which is hard to replicate in other ways. Um, so, you know, people on the Bitcoin side who think that proof of work is the best way of doing that um, say that it's not a waste of energy, that it's rather a use of energy to produce a particular type of system, which is quite hard to produce. Um, and uh, yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, proof of stake systems, instead of putting, um, uh, yeah, I guess like a reward system in, um, in energy uh, to the network, um, it instead uh, brings it um, into a place where um, people who hold more of the currency in the network are rewarded more. So is that a better system for governance of a network like that? I don't know. Um, yeah, and then I guess there's another question which means would be about comparing blockchain artwork and distribution and production to other forms of artwork distribution and production, which is very energy intensive flying around the world and storing things and, you know, um, producing large objects, etc. So um, I'm being told uh, that we're reaching the uh, edge of time here. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is, these are super, super interesting questions. And that um, also personally as an artist, uh, I, I would very much like to continue discussing, but unfortunately we are done with time. Um, so I wanted to, and I think it's, it's interesting also to end on these questions, right? So I wanted to thank you both for participating and for your really, really interesting contributions to this, uh, to this discussion. And thank you everyone at the Guggenheim again for putting up this event. And thank you to also all who watched the stream and this conversation.
Thank you so much, Louisa and Simon and Holly, for that discussion. Um, we're back here at the Guggenheim um, and entering into our final session of the day. Um, we are looking now into something a little bit more like field research. Um, we're looking and talking to um, the uh, researcher and writer Elizabeth Hoover, whose practice is related to food sovereignty and raising issues related to the relationship between land history, people, and place. Um, we're talking about the, um, the uh, activities and activism related to pipelines that are affecting food sovereignty and systems um, across the Americas. Um, and we will be also uh, following Elizabeth, talking to the artist uh, Carolina Calcedo and David de Rosas. Um, we will be meeting these people in Texas um, where they have an exhibition and we'll be learning all about the relationship between infrastructure, history, land and place. Um, I'm really excited um, about these films and I think that you will find them super stimulating as well. And um, I'm so glad that we have Macarena gomez Baris, who is an academic at Pratt Institute um, here in Brooklyn and um, she's also the author of a book called Extractive Geographies. Um, she's going to do a great job in moderating the conversation between Carolina and Elizabeth. Um, I really hope you're um, enjoying the day and I hope that you're able to engage online with us too. So I'm um, handing it over to um, the team, and I think we start with Elizabeth. My name is Carolina Caicedo. I am a visual artist. My name is David de Rosas. I, I'm a filmmaker and visual artist. We are at the Visual Arts Center at UT Austin in our show that just opened called The Blessings of the Mystery. We started working on it uh, three years ago when we got invited by folks at Ballroom Marfa. Here in Texas, we know that the major industries related to land have been historically cattle and the oil industry and even the prison industrial complex industries. We were struck because uh, we were surrounded by fences all the time and then we learned that 95 percent of Texas is owned by private individuals. I think fences and, and damming infrastructures are part of a, a similar ideology, something that we call brute force infrastructures. They are, you know, monumental, they're huge infrastructures, they're imposed. It makes me think that the border fences are brute force infrastructures too. And so this body of work are all triangulated in three locations in West Texas, which is the McDonald Observatory, the Amistad Dam on the Rio Grande, and the Permian Basin oil fields. Between these three is the largest repository of rock art in the United States. The Permian Basin is like the, the biggest oil field in the United States, uh, a location that precisely speak about this uh, natural devastation. If you look at it uh, from like uh, Google Earth or satellite images, um, it looks like an immense area that has been kind of like a bomb. And we wonder also for how long uh, this ecological devastation uh, will take uh, the land uh, to heal. This is a whole new body of work sculpture with vintage and contemporary survey tools, survey flags, drawings made of fence patterns of Texas. You know, what we want to be as critical about instruments like surveying, like map making, in relationship to the process of westward expansion. Some people think of the westward expansion as a process that was like a more like a free in a way that like people basically like it took lands and it wasn't like that. Uh, it was uh, a pretty like a meditative uh, and methodological uh, process uh, where like uh, lands uh, were like a short bay in advance, privatized and then like uh, sold. You know, oil industry and the construction of pipelines, the construction of the borderline, even water infrastructures today are a continuation of colonial processes and land privatization. The exhibition and the film proposes that we start being more critical about cartography as it has been used until today. Mapping, surveying are instrumental to languages of violence that we have been discussing. So map making is not this kind of uh, uh, free of guilt process, right? 
We have to be critical about it, though it has been a way to construct knowledge and to understand places better. It is not free of guilt. It has come hand in hand with other forms of violence. The map is like a perfect example of a colonizing gaze, right? But, oh, we're trying to understand everything and everything is clear here for you. There's nothing else to understand. Like a, an interesting tool to create like a knowledge, of course, but also like a counter geographies that break that flat understanding of, uh, of the land. It's not only about mapping the land as we know it, but you know, all those aspects that build up you know, our kind of connection to the more universal core to the earth connections and trying to see how the indigenous and native people of here understand those connections. How do the indigenous people of this region call the rivers, call the mountains, call the region? Juan Mancias, who is the chairman of the Carrizo Come Crudo tribe, is the main voice and even like the spine in the film. My name is Juan Mancias and we're the place we call Sobisec Village. For the Carrizo, it's not Texas, it's Somisec. The changing of names into names that are the language of the colonizer, right? That's a, you know, verbal aggression. It's all part of taking over the land and utilizing the land. And it continues to promote the fossil fuel corporations that are, that are not human. What do we consider as the critical infrastructure? It's the air, the water, the land, and the human beings. We choose not to recognize the fact that we are part of this earth. Racism is not just about the color of being white, but it's also now about being colonized how much you've become colonized to that mentality. We have been complicit with that colonizer gaze through this format that we call landscape, right? If you think about the landscape, it's this window through which as humans we look at something. We're outside of that nature. The West it was uh, portrayed in the U.S. by a paint and photography as well as cinema as like an immense, vast, uh, empty a space. If we continue to build landscapes and think in landscape terms, we're just uh, prolonging the colonizer gaze and it's time that we actually backtrack on that and decompose it. I think it's important for us if we like are really serious about decolonizing is like understanding what are the ways of map making, where subjectivities are present, where rituals are present, where spirituality is present. How can we decompose what we know as mapping today and bring it as an instrument for decolonization. Sometimes we think about process of a colonization and settlers as something of the past, but the truth is that they keep unfolding into today. I think as storytellers, as artists, as people who produce images and therefore builds knowledge through those images and is influencing people's visions and understandings, there is a very strong way we can contribute to the construction of historical memory. I'm Elizabeth Hoover. I am an associate professor in the Environmental Science Policy Management Department at UC Berkeley. The first book that I wrote was called The River is in Us, Fighting Toxics in a Mohawk Community that focuses on environmental health research that the community did with field workers from the community. While I was there, I started volunteering with this group called Ganahio Yungoya Dohage, or We Are Planting Good Seeds, working to get people back into farming and gardening and seed saving and eating local produce. That led me to wonder, how are other community-based organizations in other tribal communities doing this work? So I started attending these different food sovereignty summits that have been popping up over the last decade or so. Traveled 20,000 miles around the country and went to 40 different communities and asked people, you know, what are some of the successes and challenges that you're having and facing? How are you defining food sovereignty for your community? How do you center control over a food system with the food producers and the consumers as opposed to these multinational corporations who really control the food systems now? And how do you prevent that environment from becoming contaminated through other people's bad ideas? The reason why there's such a push now and a movement to reclaim food sovereignty is because of the settler colonial system here has intentionally targeted indigenous food systems for destruction for the purposes of political domination. You go from a diet of a lot of 
meats, vegetables, berries, fruits, um, to not being fed enough and being fed foods that were very different. And it's not like people had a lot of time to pack up all of their seeds and their materials. And you know, people were rounded up and forced on a death march. People got to a new space, to a very different landscape, to and not having the, their tools and their seeds with them. And so again, had to adapt to what foods were available, what foods were given to them, and are now having to consciously work to reclaim these seed varieties and these kinds of foods. Working to reclaim health is a very political act when the health of your community has been intentionally targeted for destruction. So taking um, those ideas around control over food and agriculture systems, how do we instead localize food systems so that they all look a little different and are controlled by the local communities and are reliant on foods that will do well in those local spaces how do you remedy health through um, taking control over these food systems? Wild rice is a really important food stuff for indigenous people in the Great Lakes area. For people who go out and gather this wild rice, who take their canoes and their knockers, these two big sticks, and go out and they bend the heads of the rice over and tap it, and somebody in the back of the canoe will kind of push the canoe along. So it's a particular skill that's passed down you know, through communities, through families. And along the way, you have all of these specialists who are making their living for the year. When tribal nations signed treaties with the United States, it was often with the understanding that people would still have the right insured through law to gather traditional foods in these spaces and those rights are being threatened by the potential of those spaces becoming contaminated. It's a really sensitive plant. It requires a certain amount of very clean water and so if those waterways are contaminated that plant dies and it's very hard to bring it back. It's really difficult to reclaim chemical pollution or oil or other petrochemicals. Pipelines are being touted as a more efficient way to get oil to places where that oil is then refined and often shipped to other places around the world. The concerns is that pipelines leak. It's not like, oh, if this pipeline leaks, it's when and where it's going to leak. And you have to decide whose property do you put a pipeline over. Um, and so companies feel that they can route these pipelines through these spaces that are blank on maps and left intentionally blank on maps. It's like, oh, here's all this empty space up here. We're just going to run the pipeline over the space that looks very empty on the map, but which on the ground is a very important habitat for wild rice and where native communities are out in spaces insured through treaties gathering food. I mean, leaving something blank can be an act of cartographic violence, right? Deciding what goes onto the paper and is deemed as worthy of being mapped and what spaces get left blank. To the outside viewer, it's like, oh, it's a map. It's very objective, right? This is just showing me where things are. But a lot of power goes into deciding what is put on that map, what is brought attention to, what is seemed, deemed as worthy of, of mapping out there. A big part of the activism of these indigenous water protectors and allies has been to make very visible to the public, you know, what does it look like when a big scar is cut through the earth to put these pipelines in? What does it look like after they're leaking? What does it look like when people go to resist those and are then pepper sprayed and beat up by the police? It has taken indigenous leadership, but also other allied communities that recognize that these are terrible projects and are not worth permanent environmental destruction. When it comes to how does the architectural community figure out how to be better allies, there's not gonna be one big be an ally to the world answer. It's gonna be what do the communities in your region want and need? And it's gonna look a little different in every different place depending on the communities there and the settler colonial history that those communities have had to navigate and face and rebound from, you know, allyship is important. Allyship that follows indigenous leadership is even more important and that takes as many numbers as possible.
So good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Buenos dias. My name is Macarena Gomez Varis, and I come to you from Lenape Hoking Territories in Brooklyn, New York. And I'm excited today to be in conversation with Carolina Caicedo and Elizabeth Hoover. You just saw two short films uh, based on their work. And I wanted to take a few minutes before our conversation to open the panel, since I think we have some common themes across our work. And I myself am a researcher. I've written on these themes and the, extract, the extractive zones, social ecologies, and decolonial perspectives, as well as in other writings. Um, I think some of the commonalities include discussing histories of colonialism and modernity that erase indigenous land rights and practices and certainly the colonization of waterways as both of you described in those short pieces, the building up of extractive infrastructures and how I think Elizabeth said this, the bad ideas, right, of colonial. We can think of oil pipelines and dams, how they continue to devastate local, small and artisanal agriculture. And of course, pollute the ground and toxify the waterways. These are key issues of our times, of course. I think another commonality is the effort through our writing, our research, through visual arts, through activism, to really center indigenous voices and what I often call submerged perspectives that effort to make visible those who are working against the violence of settler colonialism and who are working uh, you know, for creating an, another kind of world um, you know, beyond the divide of the genocidal practice of settler colonialism. I wanted to mention that in the recent turn to decolonize everything, um, which is really important actually, but it, it's sometimes forgotten uh, what the non-Indigenous Australian scholar Patrick Wolfe described as the logic of elimination or that settler colonialism is a system, right? It's rather than any single historical event. And it's a system meant to perpetuate the erasure of native peoples as a precondition for settler expropriation of lands and resources. That has to be central to our discussions um, it, when we talk about settler colonialism or coloniality and also uh, the decolonization. So I also think uh, it was really interesting to me to see in the short films uh, about each of your work, and you pointed to this, that there are many tools, maybe Audre Lorde would call them the master's tools, right, that are sometimes placed at the service of settler colonialism and the logic of elimination. You know, there are these narratives of growth or maybe excessive and overgrowth. There are the tools of mapping. Uh, Carolina, you talked about surveying with David. There's, of course, the obliteration of indigenous histories and long genealogies of cultural memory. And there's also this practice of seeing the land as surplus rather than seeing it as a living entity. Um, the practices, of course, of monoculture and its industry and the interest is Elizabeth's work uh, explores of you know, agribusiness or big business over community autonomy, indigenous sovereignty um, over good food and clean water. So I wanted to begin by just putting this on the table that we know of course that each of these tools is not in themselves contaminated, but they've been weaponized and put at the service of dispossession and immiseration, especially for indigenous and black peoples in the US, but also globally. And given that we were invited here, and thank you for inviting us, um, Guggenheim and the organizers, we we're invited to think also about architecture. Of course, we can deploy architecture and design to service and extend the project of colonial capitalism or potentially to redesign our food and healthcare systems so that communal sovereignty is at the center. And then the last point I wanted to make about the kind of commonality across our bodies of work, I think, is with respect to the question of indigenous land and water defense or land and water protection of territories and of waterways. And I wanted to just remind us all that, of course, it's important to place standing rock protests that were led by Sioux peoples and the coalition of strong alliances um, at the center. And this was important because it increased visibility and support um, for, you know, uh, uh, deoccupation, we might call it. 
But I also wanted to say it's an important event because um, to, it's important to consider that it's these ongoing uprisings and mobilizations and acts of protection of Madre Tierra, of Pachamama, of Mother Earth throughout the Americas continually since the 15th century. So with that really all as background, those several points as background, I wanted to start with you, Carolina, and the work that you made with David in uh, the body of work that is part of the Blessings of Mystery exhibitions in West Texas, but also the new feature film that is in post-production, Blessings of Mystery with the same title. And I wondered you know, if it's true that we are thinking about putting indigenous or submerged perspectives at the center of our work. Can you say something about um, the work you did, the process with Juan Mancias, who is described as the chairman of the Carizo and Comecrudo tribe of Texas, but also I think there was something like 20 other voices you mentioned. So if you could just talk about that process and your thinking, that would be wonderful in that new feature film. Hi everyone, thanks for connected. Really honored to be here with Elizabeth and with Maka in conversation today. Uh, the, I, I always say that Juan found us and you know that there was there was a strong desire and a willing you know for us to connect to southwest texas and we were trying to do our best through research and field work but of course you know as somebody that's new to a place you always hit a wall and then juan found us and he literally found us he he came to give a talk to Boyle Heights, where we lived at the moment uh, in a community center called La Concha on Cesar Chavez, uh, East Cesar Chavez Avenue, that La Concha is not there anymore. And um, I, I became aware that, that, that he was given a talk about uh, these villages that uh, the Carrizo Come Crudo were establishing along uh, the Rio Grande Valley to stop uh, border defense construction during the past administration. And so at the moment we had already did, uh, done a field trip to, to Texas to conduct field work, uh, to research some archives. Uh, and so of course I attended the, the talk. And, um, and, and that's how we connected with Juan. So he came to Boyle Heights <clears throat> and we continued in conversation. We visited uh, him and also visited uh, different sites with him and uh, visited his cultural center in Floresville, close to San Antonio, participated of some special ceremonies like bird dance that they conduct um, as a way to connect not only on the research level and the things that were, we were interested to, but accept and also that invitation to come uh, to, to, his, to his place where his family lives and practices. Um, the first thing that really blew my mind uh, from, from the conversation that Juan gave during the La Concha talk uh, was that he um, explained and, and gave uh, a version or not a version, let's say an interpretation of the Lower Pecos rock art that we mentioned in the video that was totally opposite of what the academic uh, interpretation is that comes out of um, of a, of a group of people who are doing an excellent job in 3D and scanning and, and, and preserving with all their best intentions, uh, this lower Pecos rock art that is, uh, uh, you know, kind of lose, we're losing that rich history and memory because of, because it's in private land, because they're not taken care of, because of, you know, climate change effects, natural erosion, whatnot. And so, uh, the Carrizo Come Crudo understand this language as prophecies of things that are happening today from the arrival of the white man to the establishment of the oil industry, cattle and oil industry in Somisec, which is uh, their territory, Texas, and means the land of the sun. Actually, it's both sides of the Rio Grande or Rio Bravo, not only Texas. Um, and it's also prophecies of uh, urban establishment and urban growth and gentrification as we understand it today. So of course, no nothing close to what we had read and investigated about 
these paintings, uh, which the most important one is uh, known as the white shaman, which if you think about the name is already quite offensive, right? The white shaman. For the Carrizo, the white shaman is actually prophesizing the arrival of the white man to Somisek. And so just to, you know, like that small talk and, and he was just, you know, kind of giving context of that to speak about the processes of land liberation as we call them in Colombia, liberación de la madre tierra, when you actually enter a space, establish, you know, yourself there in encampments or what to stop something that's destroying that place, right? So um, the Carrizo were establishing villages along the Rio Grande Valley in locations where actually their traditional village had been at some point, the most important Jalui village called Butterfly Village, very close to the Butterfly National Center uh, that has also been impacted by the construction of the wall. And um, from the Carrizo, we also learned and understood that the wall infrastructure in the border between the United States and Mexico is not only a security infrastructure, it's actually an oil infrastructure and a water infrastructure because um, the way the wall is constructed, there's the grazing of almost a mile from both sides of the wall of any sort of vegetation. And this is, becomes a militarized portion of land with all sorts of armed militias, DEA, ICE, Texas Rangers, even paramilitary private militias, private groups that go armed out there, all sorts of surveillance devices. Uh, some of them that are included that you could actually see in the wall paintings from 4,000, 2,000 years ago in the lower pickles. Um, and, and of course, this is the perfect place to run pipelines, to run oil infrastructure, and to also um, kind of take over and hoard water pumps and water valves that, you know, irrigate the Rio Grande Valley crops and stuff. So Juan really opened our eyes, taught us a lot. The Carrizo Comecruda tribe are, you know, leading uh, right now uh, different, different struggles in Southwest Texas, uh, border construction, uh, construction of pipelines, you know, using all means they have from, you know, this literally putting themselves on the front lines, being arrested for civil disobedience uh, to suits of all, of all uh, types, you know. Um, also supporting uh, now, now, you know, Texas is also housing the new, <laughs> with all the SpaceX <laughs> happening. So, you know, this <laughs> further frontier into space, if you want, if you wish. But anyways, um, just to wrap up and, and, and hand over the word, um, it was definitely a, a blessing <laughs> to find one or that one found us and, and kind of brought us under uh, the wing of the Carrizo and taught us so many things and, uh, and allowed us to align ourselves with, with their struggles down there. Yes. I mean, I'm struck by so many things of your response in part that the butterflies, of course, have no border, um, but maybe they can't fly as high now as the border is made, right? So that's interesting, but also the rivers often that are um, diverted or polluted precisely because of the border that cuts them off. And both of you have worked extensively on rivers. Um, and for Elizabeth, I mean, in the past, your book, The Rivers in Us, is such a beautiful title, and it reminds reminds me actually of a saying by a group that Carolina's worked with in southwestern Cauca, Colombia, um, you know, about we're not just living by the river, we are the river. So this idea of this breakdown between the human and non-human or th this other modality. But in, in your past work, you've discussed in that book in particular, the material effects of industrial uh, contamination, specifically for the Mohawk community of Aqua Sassane in upstate New York. And I know that you've worked on indigenous food sovereignty in the United States on a volume with Devin Miheswa. I, I hope I'm saying Devin's last name okay. Um, and currently are working on a wonderfully titled From Garden Warriors, Indigenizing the Local Food Movement under, um, under is, that, is that the full title? Indigenizing the Local Food Movement? 
Yes, because from garden warriors to good seeds, indigenizing the local food movement. Okay, something got a little bit um, slipped there in mind. Wonderful title. So, I wonder if you could speak a little bit how you do research in your work. I know you're an academic, you're a scholar, of course, you're a writer. Um, you're from some of these communities. If you could just speak about your your practice of, of course, foregrounding indigenous peoples first and and those issues. Yeah, so I started working on that first book, The River is in Us, while I was a graduate student. Um, and so I was working on a degree in anthropology and I was visiting with a Mohawk midwife named Gudji Cook, who um, is a fantastic scholar, activist, midwife, um, everything. <laughs> you know, she's, she's an amazing human being. And she had been at the center of in previous decades to when I was visiting with her, reshaping how environmental health research was done in the community of Okwazosne. So this is a, a Mohawk community that's bisected by the U.S.-Canadian border, so a different kind of border that's militarized in its own way. Um, but industry had really set up along this river after it was widened and deepened, and then hydroelectric plants brought in some more of these infrastructures of violence that Carolina references in her film there. Um, but brought in specifically to create this hydroelectric power to then attract industry that then contaminated the water and the air for people living right downstream, which was the Mohawk community, um, is the Mohawk community. They're still there, even as many of those industrial plants have closed up with the shifting of the economy. But when it was discovered that General Motors had been leaching PCBs into the St. Lawrence River, um, Gudji became concerned about what did that mean for their food source? What did that mean for the women whose baby she was delivering, who she was encouraging to breastfeed? And so the, the quote for the title of the book, The River is in Us, came from when she had her own breast milk tested. And she said, look, you know, I found out I have this many parts per million PCBs and Myrex and all of these other contaminants. And it was like, OK, so we know we know intuitively and culturally, but now scientifically, that when the river is polluted, so are we, you know, the, the, the river is in us, the, the contamination from the factory is now in the river and it's in us. Um, so getting people to recognize that interconnection on, an, on a physical level that is scientifically quantifiable, in addition to um, having this cultural relationship with this river. So my project was really looking at um, the legacy of this community rising up and saying, we're going to do science differently here. So there, instead of, you know, Gaji and the women that she was working with recognized that they were going to need science to demonstrate what they already knew, that this river was polluted, that the pollution was getting into people's bodies and it was impacting people's health. And so they partnered with um, the State University of New York at Albany and with the um, state environment divisions and health divisions to um, bring up scientists to, to help with this work, but also demanded that they had Mohawk women that were hired as data collectors, as people who were out collecting the samples, who were then kind of dictating some of the questions that were being asked by this research. And then also thinking about the collateral impacts of environmental contamination. So there are all these health studies that were done that demonstrated that higher levels of PCBs in people's bodies led to a number of different health conditions. But then also what happens when people are told like, oh, you shouldn't eat the fish. And, you know, maybe your gardens aren't so safe either if you're living near these industrial plants. So people stop farming, they stop fishing. They don't have a bunch of money all of a sudden to go out and buy nice food like they had been growing and gathering themselves. Um, so there's a real shift of diet that then leads to other health impacts that then the community had to organize around um, trying to address some of those issues. And that's what led me to this second book project of thinking about how are other communities working to address these food systems issues, especially through community based gardening and farming projects. So I went from working with one group very closely in Akwazesne um, called or We Are Planting Good Seeds. So that's part of where the title for the new book comes from is the effort of all of these Mohawk farmers and gardeners and seed keepers um, working to organize together and try to get people, more people excited about growing food and harvesting food. And then wondering how are other communities working to address this? And that's what led to this 
current projects, the From Garden Warriors to Good Seeds. Um, I took to the road and drove 20,000 miles around the country and interviewed people in 40 different communities to find out more about these issues, how other tribal communities are addressing these things. Um, but yeah, so I've gone on for a long time, but yeah, I've spent a lot of time in gardens. So that a lot of my method is um, weeding alongside people, sorting seeds, butchering chickens, whatever it is that, that people are working on as part of their food projects. Um, so kind of not just trying to, to show up with pen and paper and you know take what I need and leave, but to also stay and contribute the kind of labor that they might be looking for. Well, I mean, I think this is, thank you for explaining that. And I think in both of your practices, um, there's this attention to daily life and attention to the way in which people live their daily lives and to actually render that in complex ways, one has to be, um, you know, a kind of alongside rather than extracting information from, right? So I think that's really important. I hear that in both of your practices. I wanted to return to the comment that I mentioned at the opening about the master's tools or these tools and even something like the scientific uh, approach or Western scientific approach or data collection or in, you know, in your work, Elizabeth or Carolina has talked about mapping as a colonial tool, right? These ways that um, there are either, you know, there are other ways to engage these strategies. There are other ways to think about um, how to put these tools to the service of potentially some other kind of end. So I wondered if you could talk about either counter mapping, Carolina, how you see that work, um, uh, you know, what I'd call research otherwise, or ways of even working, yeah, sometimes it's as if it's a, a more purist model of, of decolonization that's floating out there sometimes, right? Where it's as if we have to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but in fact, to engage a scientific community, to engage certain kinds of expertise, to engage coalitional work or certain kinds of um, tools may, may in fact be important to these various uh, struggles. So I, I wondered if you could um, speak on that, both of you. Well, in this particular uh, body, body of work and in, in the feature film that we are producing now, um, we, we keep a critical stance, not so much provide um, kind of other counter ways to utilize these, these tools. Um, and we decided to do that um, precisely because we're speaking about the Southwest uh, and, and how it continues to exist in the imaginary of people in a very particular way. Um, and, and because as I said, it's kind of the gateway now to other sort of surveillance, sur uh, surveying of, of the space now, right? With all this um, rich tycoons launching their rockets out into, into space. Um, but also, you know, from academic points with the establishment of the, the observatory in Fort Davis, for example. So if you think about Fort Davis as a gateway to the West, that was a military post and right, you know, you're standing there in that historical park. Now it's a national, like a, a, a federal park. And you look up into the mountains and there's the observatory. <laughs> right? It's like this outpost into the, into the universe. Um, but I think, I think it's important to, you know, when you do counter mapping and it's possible to do it, and it's even possible to do it with the tools of the master. And I think, Folks like forensic architecture are a great example of, of how you position yourself and from where to position the use of, of these tools, not that is not for profit, but is actually to hold accountable perpetrators of violence. Um, for the blessings of the mystery, we are we are kind of dissecting the way uh, um, you know, the Homestead Act function to you know to bring the united states out of bankruptcy after the civil war war and to displace and dispossess indigenous peoples who ended up in places like oklahoma for example um, and how you know through oil industry uh, eminent domain practices today this uh, colonization continues to unfold in texas specifically with the construction of pipelines lngs 
um, out into the coast along the borderline, along, along very vulnerable ecosystems and communities. Mm. There is the drawing that we did do that is in the film. If you saw some color pencil uh, images of a large drawing that we call Somisek. And, and we consider that as a way of counter mapping, of course, you know, using the tool of what is considered like a kid's tool, like color pencil, but putting a lot of love into bringing different things and different stories and different time periods into, into this uh, representation and, and kind of portraying of Samisek. You know, I use the word portray to portray the land. For me, it's more useful and I was ranting against landscape in the video precisely, but to portray the land, right? How can you portray a place? How can you portray a river? And for that, you have to be there and to stand there and to, you know, gather the wild rice or do what Elizabeth does, you know, not bend your back and, and you know, smell the earth. And um, so, so I think, you know, there, we, have to, we have to start rethinking the way that we, as artists, for example, that we produce visual texts, the way we refer to nature through our visuals, right? Um, rethink this like, colonial format as landscape that puts us out of uh, the natural kind of web of relationships that conform a territorial land. And, and actually, you know, through the process of, represent and portray in a place, how that, that process of portraying actually in, embeds us in this place. Um, I guess for Elizabeth a, a little bit, that's through writing, right? And through speaking with the people. Uh, for us with David in, in that particular drawing was through, through the drawing of those images that capture images from the past but images of the rock paints that catapult us into the future too, because they're prophecies, right, into today's. Um, but yeah, I think a map has to it needs to be able to connect us with the past, with the future, with what is above us, but what is below us too. Thank you for that, Carolina. Elizabeth, did you want to? Yeah, I just I, I mentioned briefly in the video. Um, about how the way that pipeline companies depict these spaces is just these blank squares on maps that you can just run a line through. And that's a big part of where the effort of organizations like Honor the Earth that organize these pipeline rides to ride horses across the spaces where those pipelines would go as a way of bringing imagery to the broader public of this is the space where this pipeline goes. This is the wild rice lake that will be contaminated. Um, and that was for the Sandpiper Pipeline in 2014. And now um, ongoing efforts to resist line three as they continue to, to dig in the ground, dig under waterways. Um, there are many water protector camps set up trying to draw attention to these spaces, to these exact waterways, um, because these very sterile maps, as you've described, don't give any indication of what that landscape actually looks like and what it actually means to the people living there. Great. So I have one last question um, and then maybe some concluding thoughts for each of you. And maybe we'll start with Elizabeth, since this comes in part from your discussion of allyship that was brought up in the film, which I think is so critical. Um, some of us call it being a comrade or being an ally to indigenous peoples, uh, the Red New Deal that has been um, put forward by the Red Nation recently talked also about the importance of indigenous leadership at the forefront of addressing these questions. And you put that so well. Um, in each of your work, how, how, do, how do you think that operates? I mean, um, and if there are, any kind of, I don't want to say advice, but maybe advice for other artists, scholars, activists, thinkers, students out there who are really wanting to do this work. I know at Pratt, when I work with students, they all ask me how to do that. How do we do this work? We know we can diagnose these issues. We now have the critical tools. What are the, some of the next steps that we can take? So I have my own take on that, but I'd love to hear from you first, Elizabeth, how, um, how you see that. Um, operating in your work or how you, what you would say. And then Carolina, thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the bit in the video was kind of in response to the, the cameraman had asked me right before they were packing up kind of the, you know, what can architects do? And my response was the, the problem is that you can't, I can't just give you a blanket solution. There is no blanket solution to anything. And it reminded me of, you know, a lot of times when I'm giving talks about, um, you know, the native food sovereignty movement and seed sovereignty movement and these efforts in communities to reclaim and relocalize um, horticulture, agriculture. And there's always somebody who stands up, um, you know, usually an engineer or somebody of the sort and says, but how are we gonna feed the world? Like these ideas are really cute. Um, this is really nice, but how are we gonna feed the world? And I'm always asking who's the we who's going to feed the world? You know, how's that worked out so far when you know, organizations like the US have been like, oh, here, we're just going to grow all the stuff and dump it on you. And you're welcome, have some food. Um, it hasn't worked well. And so, you know, the problem is not necessarily that there, if you look at the global production of food, that there's not enough food, it's an issue of distribution and community control and localization. And so how do we localize food systems? And that takes um, you know, handing over control and decisions and land, land back, give it back to, you know, the, the people who have been unfairly ousted from these spaces. But it's about, um, you know, relocalizing food systems, relocalizing control over things. And there's a, a role and a position for allies, for people with resources, whether they be monetary resources or intellectual resources or resources of time. Um, but it takes people with those resources approaching communities and community organizations and saying, what do you need? As opposed to, you know, so often I have students from different programs on the country, these social entrepreneurship companies, and they'll, they'll write to me and they'll say, I came up with this great project. Who can I take this to? Um, who can I drop my project on? It's like, well, you've gone all backwards with it. If you've developed the project and now you're just trying to figure out where to plug it into, um, you know, what you should do is say, okay, here's my skill set. Here's what I have. Here's what I'm good at. Here's what I'm interested in. Um, how does that align with what the community needs and collaboratively develop these kind of projects that way so that you're developing using more of a Venn diagram of what does the community need and what do I have to offer and where do those overlap and how can we develop a project accordingly rather than I've developed this neat thing, who can I drop it on? Wonderful, thank you, Carolina. I totally echo Elizabeth, and um, it's you know it's time for us to recognize indigenous leadership um, to also honor that they've been in the front line of all sorts of struggles uh, for so long, you know, and and now all these struggles want to get dumped into a single again colonizer term that we call climate change, climate justice which has so many, you know, threads and particularities. So we should be attentive, you know, as, as people who use words and images, how we are using those words and images to Juan uh, uh, the Carrizo Come Crudo tribe is non-federally recognized tribe, non-state recognized tribe. Um, you know, indigenous knowledge has historically been stigmatized and pushed to the side. And more if there's no federal recognition, there's, you know, they're, they're, they don't even have land as uh, people in reservations. So it's time to recognize and to open the space and to transfer resources and to give land back for sure. And to leave our aesthetic uh, intellectual goals in a second position and again, understand and ask, what are your needs? That's, you know, what Elizabeth said is, this is the first step. What are your needs? What do you need? How can I support your agendas? How can I, you know, walk along you and, and support, you know, what, what your goals are? So I echo a lot what Elizabeth just said beautifully. I think what you both are also pointing to is the need, uh, certainly our institutions come out of long histories of colonialism as well, right? And higher education does as well. So the need to really 
transform disciplines. I mean, there are a lot of tools to be taken from the disciplines, but how to also think about putting those um, at the service of community needs and the ways that you both just outlined. So thank you very much. I wonder if you have any final words or anything that you wanna point our audience to in your practices or in your writing, um, and then we'll close. Any final words? Um, I want to invite you uh, next week. We will have a live podcast from UT Austin. Uh, I think it's the 27th and the 28th, uh, also a, a live st uh, or streamed uh, roundtable with Juan Mancias and some scholars at UT Austin with the head of the Texas Archaeological Research Lab, Fred Valdez and Professor Marta Lenchaca from UT Austin in the context of the exhibition. So if you are curious about the blessings of the mystery, about Juan, uh, what Juan you know, has to say and whatnot, please connect. And it's all on the website of the Visual Arts Center. Um, Great, Elizabeth, did you have any final words? I don't think so. Thank you all for joining today. And I just encourage folks to um, find out whose land you're on. And you know, the, there was a great report that came out recently about land grab universities and looking at how universities like UC Berkeley, where I'm currently employed, really benefited from the theft of land from indigenous communities and the sale to other settlers. Um, so yeah, I encourage people to, to find out whose land you're on and you know, what can be done to support those people. So important what you both are saying in part because we're so complicit or imbricated, these systems are so imbricated in ways, complex systems, right? And cultural institutions, academic institutions, et cetera. So yes, land-based knowledges, wonderful and practices. Thank you both. It's been a pleasure to be in conversation with you today. And thank you to the Guggenheim. We really appreciate the time. And thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of you for listening, for speaking with us in the chat today, for participating. Um, it's been an incredibly illuminating day. And to our speakers and our panelists, thank you for your challenges, for your questions, for your arguments, um, and for creating this space today for all of us to think in new and different ways about these really important issues of architecture, equity, land, space, sovereignty, voice, story. Um, I'd also love to announce that um, you don't have to worry, there will be more to come. This really wonder wonderful and fruitful partnership with the world around uh, will continue as a result of our residency. We will be co-hosting together next year's January, February summit, the beginning of the year. We hope you stay tuned. We hope you continue to follow and to participate in the dialogues that we're having with each other and with you. And again, we thank you and with that, um, my tremendous gratitude to Beatrice and the world around for being such incredible partners and for making this dialogue possible. Thank you, Syra, and thanks everybody um, for watching. And again, this is the, the last event of our residency with the Guggenheim, which has been such a fantastic relationship and collaboration with the Public Programs Department. And we are um, so happy to be coming back next year with our annual summit. Um, so once again, thank you, Renee, Joseph, Emmanuel, Holly, Simon, Louisa, Carolina, Elizabeth, and Macarena for all of your your effort, your wisdom, your creativity, and thank you to the World Around um, team. Thank you to the World Around Board of Directors and Trustees and our partners, our global partners, Facebook, Open Arts, and Amura. Um, we are so happy to have been here. We hope you have a great uh, weekend, and we'll see you in the new year. See you next year. <laughs>